I was looking to do this in four countries. And even after okay. that, you know, practically showing them how, you know, they can access funding to rebuild their businesses. You know, it's a, it's a continuous advisory and perhaps even, a, you know, having a refinancing fund within it, which they can access to rebuild themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, thank you so much for that brief introduction. And thanks so much for all your introductions, you know, and the expectations you have on the call. Um, just as I have uh, requested kindly all the expectations that you already shared, Alice, uh, Pauline Marima, and the rest, Maureen, would you kindly just type the expectations that you shared on the group? I just would love our technical teams to be able to, you know, to catch up with those people like Cecilia and uh, Dr. Roland, whom I see is just coming, uh, you know, can catch up with what we've just done um, over there, right? Yeah. yeah, so just put them on. Thank you so much for the intros and for laying down the expectations that, 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 you, that you have for this call and for the process so far. I'd love to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Roland Roberts, who I think has just logged in um, uh, to the call. Dr. Roland, good morning. Greetings, how are you? Fine, thank you, how are you doing? Very good. I would like to explain yeah, I know. to everyone. Yeah. Good morning to everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for joining us. I know it's very early on your end um, in the US. Um, we've just kicked off the call about uh, 17 minutes ago. And uh, what we kicked off with was a, a brief uh, round of introductions. You know, the enterprises just introduce themselves, what their projects are and the expectations for the call, just so that we are adding value to the call, yes. right? Um, everybody, I'd love to introduce Dr. Roland Roberts. Um, he is, you know, a world known uh, leader. He's an advisor to national governments. He's an entrepreneurship expert. You know, um, he's, 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 he's an investor himself, a business expert across uh, various fields. And uh, he actually is the, you know, a partner for the funding tour direct, you know, he and I, the Timeless uh, Platform and Courageous His Platform and his, his organization are the two companies that's leading the, the funding tour. And he'll be represented, representing the investors. So on this call, he'll be giving insights you know, from himself as an enterprise expert and also from an investor's perspective, representing the investors who are going to be with us on the funding tour. Welcome, Dr. Roland. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, would you like to, to, to say something you know, about yourself and, and the, intro, the intro part, just for, the, for them to understand you a little bit more? Uh, sure. Well, it's, first of all, it's great to be with you. And, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and economic development is, is central uh, to, to a company's, uh, to, it's really to a country's growth. And I think it is the greatest economic instrument on the earth today. It is the best thing that you can be doing for yourself, for your family, uh, and for those that you, for even your children and your children's children. I believe that you're building an asset. Uh, you are seeing long term, not just short term. Sometimes the easier thing is just to just to go do something else, and it takes tenacity. Uh, you will go through difficult times, and uh, and that's what helps mold and shape us into the, into the kind of person that is capable of taking investment dollars and handling them responsibly. Uh, because if you're anything like I was, uh, whenever I first started in business, and even a few years after, uh, I would get some, some type of funding, and I thought it was enough, and I thought it would get me to the milestones that I had predetermined, only to find out that I was short, or only to find out that it didn't achieve the result that I thought. I thought, okay, if I have $100,000 to put into marketing and I do social media and I do offline or maybe billboard or radio advertising or TV advertising, I will get to a certain a number of clients and then that equals a certain amount of revenue. And in fact, that it might not be what happened and it, we didn't get quite as many as we thought. And, and so we weren't as far along as we thought we would be with the amount of investment that we took. So these are a lot of considerations that we that I If you can use your phone, uh, uh, 
Paris, would you kindly mute? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Sorry, Dr. Roland, you can go ahead. Oh, yes, no problem. No problem. Okay, uh, what I have done is I went ahead and muted everyone, and then if you would like to speak, if you would just click the unmute button, uh, you do have that uh, authority. Uh, so please feel free to do that, uh, so that so that everyone is able to hear. Uh, that that'll make it go smoothly. Uh, but those are just a few initial ideas. Um, and I can, uh, on, in terms of investment, in terms of the importance of of a strategy and understanding the really thinking through the decisions. How much money do I need to accomplish a certain result? Uh, knowing that as an investor and also as business owners, we know things rarely go as planned. So it is important to, to account for the unknown, account for the surprises, uh, plan on things not going right and still be fine. And also, uh, I can tell you to prepare for the funding tour, uh, it is important that you think through uh, what you will be doing with the money. And the answer to that question is, is vital to the success of your fundraising. Because a lot of people in their minds, they are solid on how much money they believe they need to get their business to the next level. However, when you start asking them, well, what are you gonna do with it? Okay, so I deposit a million dollars in your bank account tomorrow, now what? And then it's easy to spend uh, other people's money, but whenever you end up having resources yourself, you would probably spend them differently. So it's important to know and really think through how you're going to spend it. Uh, and that needs to be very viable. Uh, I remember briefly uh, when I was in Spain and we had assembled the top 20 startup companies in the world. And they, uh, we went through this exercise with each of them uh, prior to funding. And one of them actually thought that they were gonna take their, their million dollars and uh, be, uh, be, uh, place an ad on a social media app called Snapchat. Now, back then, this was in 2016, Snapchat was just becoming large and known, and everyone thought it was the new up and comer. And, and, but, and Snapchat only allowed big, big brands to advertise on their platform. And the starting ad was $2 million for like a 30 second ad. Two million dollars, and so they. This company actually said that they were going to take the funding. They thought that's all they would need, and everybody would fall in love with them and love their product and service and start using them. Well, as you can imagine, they did not get funded because no investor was going to give a million dollars for a chance and a very remote chance. And we actually had one of our investors that uh, had, was, was working with Snapchat and knew for a fact that they wouldn't even be accepted. So their whole business model, their whole premise was based on false logic and a false foundation. So hopefully in the purpose of, of, of many of these sessions are to help prepare you and your company, your answers, your responses, uh, so that uh, for the tour, uh, you are, are very clear on how much you need and how the, the funds will be used. Now you can. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roland. You're already on it, you know, and uh, I think I'd really love to thank the enterprises and the project owners that are already in the call on time because then they get the most of everything that, that can, can help increase, you know, a better outcome for each of the projects. I mean, your insights, 
your experience, the experience as an investor and with investors, I think will add a lot of value on this call. And just for your sake, um, Dr. Roland, and for those who have just joined, I'd just love to sort of like go back a little bit onto you know, how we began the call and, and who's on the call and, and then get on to uh, providing an objective uh, for this call, you know, a formal objectives for this call so that we can then embark on some of the conversations you're all looking, looking forward to. Um, on the call, we have, as you've, have you, as you've just listened to, Dr. Roland, who's representing um, investors and, and, and enterprise expertise. And then we have Michelle Mocha, who's uh, representing the team of technical and business advisory experts that have been looking and appraising the, the projects. So they're going to be giving preliminary outcomes and observations that they have, they have you know, found across each country uh, submissions and uh, some of the insights and some of the ideas and recommendations to strengthen the proposals further. So we're going to be hearing from Michelle. She'll be joined um, shortly by Cecilia. Cecilia is the lead uh, of the legal and technical team. Um, I'm sure she'll be coming on um, a little bit um, later on, but Michelle has been working with the teams behind the scenes, so we'll have a very good grip of what's going on. We have Molly on the call from Timeless, who's acting as the liaison between the projects and the technical teams, supporting the projects you know, in terms of communication, admin, any support they need. And then we have uh, all these entrepreneurs who are on the call and some will continuously be joining, um, whom have given you know, a bit of, of overview of the nature of business or projects they're, they're, they're submitting and the expectations that they have for this call. Uh, Dr. Roland and others who have just joined, if you could look at the chart, you can get a sense of the expectations that they share, because I asked them for efficiency to just type, the, type it in there so that those who come later can be able to click on that. So when you have a moment, you can just look through the chart and you will be able to see the expectations of the teams. So without much ado, I just would love to, again, go back a little bit on the objective of the funding tour, the objective of this stage, and, and we can kick off formally. I'll pass it over to Michelle and Dr. Roland to give insights as we go. And this is an interactive session because we want to ensure that we give you as much value as possible. So as we share information, feel free to raise your hand, you know, to put on the chat when you have a question or a comment, you know, to be able to, to engage, okay? So it's interactive, feel free, um, let's flow. Yeah, so again, objective of the funding tour. When you look at um, the opportunities that, that, that exist on the continent of Africa, when you look at the talents, uh, the, the, the intellectual ideas, you know, the creativity that exists on the continent of Africa. As it does, but uh, for this tour of Africa, I'm focusing on data and information on the continent. Okay, we've got a lot of ideas, a lot of projects, a lot of enterprises that are really, um, you know, providing you know good solutions to problems around our communities. Um, mitigating uh, some of the risks and gaps that we have in industry and, and they have a lot of potential to grow. However, you find that sometimes the challenges that enterprises or projects, whether they are small, medium or large, um, you know, they come into a place where they're facing challenges, you know, in terms of accessing markets, accessing products, you know, accessing support, opportunities and financing. And uh, you know, within the Timeless Network, you know, regionally and globally, we've got a lot of interested parties and players, stakeholders, who are interested in investing on the continent and putting money through a trusted platform, through a trusted platform, you know, into ideas and projects that can bear fruit and value, okay? It's one thing to have money, it's another thing to be able to know where to put that money and to put it in a safe place. We've got, you know, unscrupulous practices and, and you know, platforms that may not be trusted. So people are very cautious on how they want, how they can be able to, to spend their money. So, you know, between, um, you know, the Timeless Network and Courageous, uh, led by Dr. Roland, we, we sat and looked at, um, you know, a way to bridge these needs. We've got people who would love to put their money into good ideas and get, uh, a, you know, a, a good return and get value for their investment. We've got people on the continent, you know, across all sectors who have great ideas, great businesses, great projects, and are looking for that funding. So we are acting as that bridge to provide that solution, okay? Um, the funding tour will be taking place over six countries, um, Kenya, Rwanda, Botswana, Malawi, Zambia, and South Africa. 
these are the initial countries that will be taking part in the in the Africa funding tour, you know, in this first round. And these are the, you know, the early, early birds, let's call it early birds, the first movers, the people who on our network were ready to respond, ready to come onto the tour. And, and we're really excited about that. Now, a lot of you have asked about process and, uh, and timelines and things like that. I'd just love to have an overview or, you know, of that for your understanding and for your comfort. The process uh, formally began in, in, in you know, March, April, where we sent out requests for projects and enterprises to submit their proposals, their executive summaries, okay? Now, um, with, with that need, what we were trying to achieve was getting submissions from people who are interested in accessing funding and who are viable and want to engage with the process in a serious way, okay? So the first stage of this process is to submit executive summaries, which are high level overviews of the ideas, the projects, and the, and, you know, and the things that you want to submit, ideas for funding. These have been submitted to a technical team and an appraisal team and a business development support team represented on this call by, Mich by Michelle. And um, the team has been going through these submissions from all the six countries I have mentioned over the last one, one month or so, you know, from April and May, between April and May. And they have preliminary analysis and, and outcomes of that initial um, analysis, analysis and appraisal. And you will listen to, to that outcome, initial outcome from Michelle. Also with insights, recommendations, and um, instructions to strengthen the, the submissions further. Once we are done with this virtual call, this, the objective of this virtual call is to provide feedback to you on your submissions, to provide insights and guidance, such as what Dr. Roland was already doing, just so that you can be able to have uh, uh, you know, insights and empowerment to be able to go back and strengthen your submissions to increase chances for a better outcome at the end of this process. So this call will be interactive and, and, and will meet those objectives to be able to just offer a, a, you know, a, a process for you also to engage, to ask questions, to share your ideas, and to just feel more confident about how you're engaging in this process. We would love the process to be as inclusive as, as, as uh, practically possible so that um, you're able to be equipped and empowered to be able to do the best that you can with your submission, right? Now, you know, one of our, our original um, uh, intentions, you know, uh, Dr. Roland, myself, and the stakeholders behind the scene was to have a physical engagement with all of the enterprises at this point. But you all know that, you know, with the COVID travel bans and the lockdowns, you know, and the travel advisories, we're not able to do that. But that said, and thanks to technology, we said we would actually have an online virtual review, okay, to be able to push the process along so that it doesn't become a hindrance and we're able to be able to be preparing even as we wait for the travel bans and all that to be lifted. So this virtual review is a step in the process that will allow you to engage interactively with us and get you know, uh, better equipped to strengthen your proposals, okay? Um, once we finish this virtual call, um, and I will be sharing together with the team that, that's on, on, on the call with us, we'll be sharing the next steps moving forward. But in terms of general high level you know, process, the virtual review is, is, is this initial uh, phase to have you get feedback and then you go back to strengthen your proposals with the various you know, metrics, checklists, or whatever advice will be given on the call. And those submissions need to be resubmitted by the 10th of July because the appraisal team, remember, they're not just working with the Kenya projects, um, they're working with the other five countries' project submissions. So they need enough time to actually go through the appraisals and analyze them, you know, group them, you know, you know give any advice and, and help prepare for, for the next stage that will come after that. And um, yeah, so once, once the submissions are received on the 10th, it will go through the second iteration of the appraisal process. And between the 10th and the 30th of July, the technical team will give feedback on, on, on your submission, where you're at, what, what you need to prepare, what you need to do before the physical and actual funding tour, which is scheduled for August 2020, by God's grace. Where we have looked at that timeline because we are optimistic that by that time, our countries will have lifted travel bans, will be able to travel, and, uh, and, you know, our teams will be able to move around, you know, 
for the two who are physically. Our team of investors, you know, led by uh, Dr. Roland, our team of technical, and uh, our, our, our timeless teams that will be able to move around um, in the various countries for, this, for the physical tours. The physical tours will take place in the month of August with two days set aside for each country. And of course, in between the restructuring and preparation for the technical team that's, that's, that's engaged in the tour. Uh, Kenya's dates are 3rd and 4th of August. And so take note of those dates because physically, um, you're going to be able to come and physically engage with investors. Hopefully by that time, you're confident, you've you know, beefed up your, your submissions, you know, um, they're viable and you know, we're good to go and, and hoping for a very favorable outcome. And, and that process will take place in Nairobi. The location and details of that meeting will be shared with, uh, with you nearer the time, okay? Because we want to ensure that we don't have just any Tom, Dick and Harry appearing at the venue. It has to be credible, you know, approved, you know, people who've been part of this process end to end. So that's an overview of, of, of the process. And, uh, and I don't know if you have any questions so far on process and, and timelines. The objective that we've put, you know, our objective of the funding tour is as much as possibly possible to ensure that you're well prepared to, to, to come face to face with the investors and that the investors will find good reason to invest and that they will make verbal offers within the tour. Within those two days, we've set aside time for offers, for deal making, you know, uh, and the idea is to actually make offers and the offers that are made will be tied out legally, you know, in written within a, a week or two after each country's funding tour. So that is the process. And then, of course, we will embark on to, you know, um, engagement and support from our technical team that, that you, you know, you, can, you have on the call today and others in the back end that will be supporting that relationship, okay? Just to make sure that it's moving along well. Right. So any questions so far um, on process and timelines before then we get onto the, the technical staff and feedback on your submissions. And anyone that has a question, please just un you can unmute yourself uh, to be able to ask the question. Yeah. Um, so assuming the third fourth engagement is successful. Uh, when do we expect the actual funding to happen? Is it in the new year in January or what does it look like after the August uh, engagement? Did that, the answer to that depends on, on a couple of factors. Number one, the type of funding you're receiving, whether it's debt or equity. And obviously debt, you can receive faster. Uh, equity investments, th uh, those can take you know, 60 to 90 days. Uh, a debt in instrument, can take 30 to 60 days. So you're looking uh, generally um, uh, from October, between October and the end of, of December, depending on the type of funding and depending on the amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and thank you, Dr. Roland. That's a good point, uh, you know, and thanks for clarifying that. And, and for all of you, in your submissions, there's a number of you I know who've come back to our teams asking about uh, you know, technical equipment, you know, machinery, you know, those who are moving into production, manufacturing, value addition, you know, who need, who have needs for technology. There's a number of, 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 of enterprises, not just in Kenya, but the other countries that have also been asking about um, investors who are going to be also involved in, um, in, you know, technical advisory, okay, and, and strategy, you know. So again, like Dr. Roland says, the nature and shape and form of each project may, may be unique and, uh, and the various parameters that come into play, you know, um, will, be, will, will, will be, you know, determined, decided with any consultation with the project owner. Yeah, so just to take note of that. Thanks for that. Anybody else with a question? This is Ali. Um, uh, I thank Dr. Roland for uh, explaining the type of the types of financing options. So it, I think we are not look. This is not funding. We are looking at financing options, debt, equity. I think those are the two ones which were mentioned. I didn't hear grant or uh, other types of financing options. Uh, my question was: if it is debt uh, financing, what kind of interest rates are we looking? at and in which currency? 
Thank you, Alice. I appreciate the question. Uh, the answer to that in short is, uh, in terms of interest rate, that's going to vary by lender and, uh, and by risk. So for example, <clears throat> there's a big difference if, uh, uh, and also based on amount. So there, there are three uh, strong variables there. Uh, and but you will have the ability to accept or reject uh, any offers, number one. Uh, and, and so if there are, it, it depends on the industry, it depends on the nature of your business. So for example, if you're doing $50,000 in revenue and a total for your whole business, and you're trying to get a $100,000 loan, uh, that's going to, that's a lot riskier than someone that is doing a million dollars, uh, you know, a year in revenue and, um, uh, you know, and has real estate uh, perhaps as an asset uh, and, and then trying to uh, raise a hundred thousand dollars, right? That's, there's not much, there's not near as much risk in that transaction. So the interest rate will be considerably lower. Um, but I can tell you that uh, the, the investors um, coming from the United States, we have a framework of what is a what is appropriate, what is even legal and not legal in the United States uh, to prevent any type of um, uh, interest rate gouging and so forth. And so I, I do not um, uh, worry about that. But, you know, if you're debating between a, you know, 7% or 9% or 8%, you know, if you're, if you're negotiating a uh, room there, uh, you know, you're not going to be up in the, you know, you know extremely high, um, like a, like a cash advance or a pay loan, payday advance kind of scenario. Um, so I think there's an appropriateness that the investors bring that, that is rooted in what they are able to do in the United States. And this is also an interesting point because they are bringing the processes that they have used for years. So some of them have invested in over a hundred companies over the course of, you know, the last decade. So if you're investing uh, heavily in, you know, 10 companies a year, that means they're probably vetting, you know, 30 or 40 companies a year in order to finance 10. Uh, where they come to terms together and where you all mutually agree on the terms. And then it goes to, uh, you know, they have their due diligence team where they kind of run through that and they will be relying on Timeless's teams that she mentioned uh, prior as well with the appraisal teams and valuation teams. And, and so that, that uh, they're relying on that information as well. They make sure that the business has what they say they have. If they say they have, they own 200 acres, uh, over here, then, you know, they want to make sure that you do indeed uh, own the 200 acres and that it's not your cousin's cousin that owns the 200 acres. Uh, and so they, they'll they make sure, they'll verify the facts uh, that as you've presented it and as they made the offer based on those, uh, the verbally. So they'll make sure that it's what it is. And that's what moves it to funding. They have their own uh, closing document that can be signed uh, virtually. And so you're able to, uh, to sign that document, um, which agree, which outlines the terms to which, uh, you all have agreed. So that's on the financing side. You are correct that the, the investors that we have will not be issuing grants. Uh, the, the organization, there are a lot of organizations that, that serve, um, the African continent, uh, with grants, uh, that is, uh, very competitive. It's also very, very few in terms of, you know, really getting getting some meaningful dollars there and um, uh, so while that's possible that's not what the purpose necessarily of, of these investors are, are focused on uh, there are some United Nations initiatives that I think we will be able to add later uh, and in future uh, you know uh, tours and so and we're greatly looking forward to that I was speaking with uh, my contact and friend at the at the United Nations um, last week and uh, you know they're, they're just thrilled at the work that we're doing and they're watching um, the success of, of this program and of each of you and uh, of each of the business owners in 
that we'll be working with over the next couple of days. So we're, we're happy to be a part of this. Now on the equity side, so we've talked a lot about financing. Let me talk about uh, the equity side. The way equity works, uh, it, it's a very trusting relationship, really on both sides, but at least on a, on a lending side, it's, it's, it's more, uh, it's more direct, it's more defined. And the, there's a payback, we know how much is being paid back and we know when it's paid back. There's risk that your company may not be able to pay all or you know, just a part of it back. But, but equity works a little bit differently. Equity is where, uh, let's say um, I'm putting $100,000 uh, of equity into your business. That means that I give you $100,000 cash. Now maybe, based on your business, I, uh, we decide mutually that I'm willing to invest $100,000, but I don't think you should have it all at once. I think you should have it $25,000 per year for four straight years because I don't want you to spend the money and then be like, Oh, I need another hundred thousand. So let's just say that then you have a hundred thousand dollars that we give 25,000 per year And each time. Let's say uh, uh, if your business is worth a million dollars and I give you a hundred thousand, that means I get a 10% equity stake in your company. Okay. I'm going to say that again, because I really want you to understand this. If your comp business is worth a million dollars and I put in a hundred thousand, that means that's a hundred thousand is 10% of a million. So I get a 10% stake in your company. Now, if I only put in 25,000, then that would only be 2.5% stake. So maybe we have the whole investment is a hundred thousand for 10% equity in your company. But because I'm going to put in 25,000 per year, uh, you, I only get 2.5% equity the first year. I only get 2.5% equity the next year when I put in another 25. Because here's what may happen. You may get to year three and be like, we don't wanna give up any more equity. We're doing well. We had something else happen and we don't even, you know, 25,000 is not gonna make that big of a difference for us, so we don't need it, okay? And so that, that, that provides some good flexibility uh, for both the investor and for the business. Because when it comes to funding, it's not all about getting all the money you can. It's, it's really about how can you use that and how much of your business you're willing to part with. And one of the things that I hope that you pick up from our time together is, is the way Nyakin and I work as well. It's, a true partnership has a lot more to do than just money. There is trust and there's, but there's also partnership. There is, there is strategy. There, there are intangibles that investors can bring to your business. So if I were you, when the investors are, when you are presenting your business to the investors, look for, what are the additional ways they can add value to my business beyond money? And there's a phrase that I've used, all money is not equal. <laughs> uh, $10 uh, from me might be worth more or less than $10 from someone else because of the value that I bring to it. Or if the person is a jerk, keep your $10. I don't need the daily headache, right? I don't, as a business owner, you don't want someone, uh, you know, calling you every day. Did, did the sales skyrocket? What about today? What about now? What about, well, that's not how business works. You got to give it time. You have to, we have to go through these process. And so, uh, but two different investors could have put in the same amount of money and your experience be completely different. So evaluate who is, do, who do you connect more with? with your personality, who, uh, who do you think brings additional value? Maybe they know, I, I see, we, you know, an entertainment company, for example, maybe, uh, you know, they have great relationships in the entertainment industry and can help, uh, help, help scale your business in a unique way outside of money, which they will happily do because they have a financially vested interest. 
So those are a few considerations when you are considering debt financing uh, versus equity financing. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Uh, there was also, was there a third mode of financing that you mentioned I didn't get? Because I, I only picked debt and equity. And number two, and this may be my final for this time period, what range of, finan of financing are we talking about? Uh, not the actual figure, it's like the, the funding levels range from X to Y. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alice. Uh, would you, I think, uh, I wanna make sure I understand your first question. You were asking if there was a third type of financing that I mentioned, is that correct? Yes, yes. It's like I had three types of, you know, types of financing that you mentioned, but I only picked two quickly, that is debt and equity. Did I miss a third one? The third one that I briefly mentioned was, was grants. Uh, yeah. and, and, and that really is, uh, is something that we, we might be able to add at a later time, uh, but that's not a part of this particular funding tour because of uh, the scarcity. And especially at this time uh, in this pandemic, global pandemic season, uh, a lot of finances have been redirected to uh, pandemic efforts that were, you know, for other type uh, efforts. So, so it is, as it relates to grants. Um, and so the other issue, the other possibility that I do not think uh, that, that we may be able to add in the future as well uh, would be a fourth type of financing, and that is a microloan. Uh, but microloans are for very unique situations. Microloans are usually $600 or less, but the approval period is a lot less. You can have funds in one week and uh, that does not go based on many of the normal credit evaluation methods. Uh, so it is a great tool to use around the world. Uh, but microloans, there's only so much you can do. That's not really the level of businesses we've been working with, with, with these six African countries. And for this tour, uh, we've been fortunate uh, with uh, Ms. Nyken to, to work with the Chambers of Commerce and with other, uh, you know, even government sanctioned entities or bodies that prom promote and support economic development in their respective countries. And, and so they have, you know, all of the enterprises, including yours, you know, are established businesses in need of real funding. So the, the range of funding is between generally between 1 million, uh, excuse me, between $100,000 and $5 million. Okay. For this tour. Now, uh, if, if a company needed 15 million or 25 million, uh, we do have a couple of people that will be engaged that have the relationships and have done 15 and $25 million investments before. However, those investments are usually very specific type of projects. It's not for a clothing company who's wanting to become the next Louis Vuitton or Ralph Lauren, right? So uh, they're not taking those kind of risks with that kind of money. Uh, but usually if there are there is infrastructure, such as uh, I know we had one that was like a gas, uh, uh, pipeline and, and infrastructure, uh, you know, that's more of a consideration. Uh, also things that are real estate based. If you start getting into very high numbers, you have to be asset based. Um, and they're not going to give you $5 million to buy a coffee farm, a coffee plantation. Um, uh, if you're not in the coffee business and have 50 acres, you might not know what to do with 200. So there's, there's the, crawl before you walk uh, mentality is really what a lot of investors have. They, they don't want to be yeah. the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this, I hope that has shed some light for you. Um, and we, we are still on the call. So you, you have time and opportunity to even ask more questions as uh, Michelle and others engage. Uh, Dr. Roland, there's another question that, that is here on the group. Uh, where 
there's a question from Paris asking for debt funding. Is there a grace period before the beginning of payer? And then from Joseph um, Guerrero, we have a question. He says, I wanted to, under to also understand a bit more on who the investors are, their overall profile and market segment interests, risk tolerance, and whether long or short term. Okay, great questions. I'm gonna have you uh, repeat that second question in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in just a moment. Um, sure. So, so, Joseph, to answer the question in terms of market sector and uh, investor profiles, we will submit uh, just prior uh, to the tour investor profiles um, or actually it, it may even be at the time of uh, for each country when we are there uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, they get inundated uh, with requests and providing uh, we, we can provide the profile without probably providing the contact information um, and without providing the the invest uh, investment advisor or hedge fund uh, or venture capital fund without without put stating the name we can at least give the profile uh, you know that is something that we would be happy to do uh, but this is this is, truly is both parties are coming to this with the spirit of um, of pioneership I mean the 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 investors that are coming uh, and going to Africa in August are they they haven't done extensive deals in Africa. They are very successful and big in uh, doing funding companies in the United States, maybe in Canada, maybe you know um, in Europe, uh, but they haven't made it uh, to Africa. And the reason is the, is, is the very reason why this is needed. And that is connecting uh, you know, outside investors directly uh, with African business owners. So uh, we will provide, can provide a profile of those, um, but we also want to be respectful of, of their, their time and, um, they don't, it does not behoove anyone just because of their mindset. There is no, how do I get ahead? Maybe if I reach out to them before, you know, we meet in August, uh, they don't like to do business that way. And that's one of the benefits that I believe uh, Nike and I bring and share and add value to your companies is helping you understand helping you understand the American investor mindset and me helping the American investor understand your mindset. And uh, now I can, can share, you know, in the course of our relationship, there have been several times where we just had to check <laughs> because even with she and I, we had to give each other a lot of grace to understand, uh, you know, where I was coming from or where she was coming from and what I thought was normal or standard in most of the world was not standard there. And, and so she gave me grace and understood and then kindly and gently enlightened me <laughs> um, and, and kind of led me that way. And then of course I'm able to then tra uh, transfer that to the investor so they understand uh, because it's really easy to confuse what some the other party means. Uh, I I promise that even in uh, that that you have misunderstandings with your partner or your wife or your husband or your children, and you communicate uh, with the same language. You have the same culture. You have the same habits. You may live under the same roof, and you still have miscommunication. Right. And so even with everything being aligned, there's still miscommunication. So when you are dealing with other cultures, the, the room, the opportunity for miscommunication is greater. And that's one of the reasons it hasn't happened prior to now, because everyone 
you know, African business owners can say, well, I only want to, to take investment dollars from, you know, a, a small select pool of people and that's it. And then American investors have said um, they don't get it. They don't move fast enough. They don't know, you know, they're not sure if they want to do business with me. Well, I've got a thousand people lined up outside the door that do, you know, and so they can be curt. Um, and then you're just trying to say, I need enough information to be able to understand and trust this transaction. And they're saying, well, I've done a million of these. How can you not trust that? So, and, and that's because the businesses in America who take their funding, uh, all of those businesses aren't questioning them. And so, and they are used to being respected. And, and so, th but that's also why we have chosen investors that have a heart for Africa. And that was very important to, to, to us. Um, we, I was, did not want, you know, there's a whole lot of investors in the United States. There are institutional investors, hedge funds, venture capitalists, private, you know, individuals. And I can tell you without exception, the investors that are coming that have already agreed to come are ones that they started off the conversation trying to sell me on why they should be there with you. Telling me about their heart for Africa, telling me that they've always wanted to invest in African companies, telling me that they do believe uh, in the African spirit and the tenacity and that they, uh, uh, you know, think that it would be a worthwhile investment that they've wanted to invest there. So that is critical. That is critical, I think, to the success of this program and uh, in this tour. It re has required a lot of moving parts, and, um, and I hope that uh, many of you recognize the outstanding efforts of, of, of Nyakin and her service to all of these nations. And um, uh, in, in then facilitating that with me on, on, on the investment side, the investors, and the, the uh, itinerary, and bringing all of this together. It is very rare. Uh, what we are doing has not been done before in terms of a multi-nation tour at the same time with investors that have this kind of horsepower and funding power, because normally when investors like this travel, it's for one day maybe two days. They don't like to travel more than one or two days. And, and so to have this kind of a tour and in another country and right after a pandemic is unprecedented. And so we are, we are I, I hope that, um, uh, I, I wanted to make sure, uh, I wanna to speak to market sector real quick and then uh, his second question. And then if you'll re repeat, uh, some of the additional uh, components that he had to that question. But in terms of, of market, um, you know, originally when we first started, I wanted to bring, you know, and there are investors who, who do focus on certain markets. Uh, and we would not be at this point if we did not feel we had most markets covered. And one of the ways I knew which investors to accept and to bring and to invite was based on the executive summaries that you have worked on with your Chamber of Commerce and the, and, and the, the National Chamber of Commerce to, uh, to provide to us and, and with the teams, the timeless teams. So uh, the major sectors, as far as we have it, are, are covered. In fact, uh, and the ones that aren't covered, uh, maybe specifically, um, that we still have investors who they don't just have uh, have market niches, they have opportunity niches. So for example, uh, if your company is worthy of being funded, it means you're doing something right and you just need, you know, so, some growth capital, some infusion capital. Uh, they're not in the rescue business. You know, if, you're, if your company is failing, and not successful and you're needing to service existing debt or refinance existing debt, that's a whole different conversation than raising 
uh, funding to grow uh, or to expand. Uh, and I know uh, many of these, what interests them is it's the, it's the growth story. It's, uh, it's, are you entering new markets? Are you uh, going to a broader sales platform? Are you, uh, how are you uh, going to a different method? Um, you know, what assets, uh, what is the single best tool that you can invest in today to grow your business? What's the one thing, the one thing, what's the one thing you haven't bought? What's the one thing that you think would increase your sales, uh, you know, dramatically? So those are the kind of questions, you know, that they will, that they are more uh, interested in than, okay, you're in technology, here's a million dollar check, right? That's, in fact, some of the major market categories, uh, you're going to have to even be very sharp because remember, they get pitched all the time. So if you pitch me on a video platform like we are on today, uh, they have seen a hundred other entrepreneurs that have put together some special, special something that what they are trying to get funding to do the same thing. And that's not going to be good enough because there are some categories where things don't need to be better. What we have is, is fine. It's not worth trying to create uh, spend $10 million to create a better zoom just, you know, at this, at this point. So there are uh, those kind of, uh, that's kind of the philosophy there, but I can tell you that uh, the, all of the, I have not seen a, an executive summary come through now that I don't believe it, that, that I think is outside of our investor uh, market bandwidth. No one, no one will be up there and go, you know what? That's not even an industry we're interested in. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Um, I think the last part of that question um, was, um, are there long or short-term investors? And then with uh, Paris, she asked, once they give the, the, the funding, debt funding, is there a grace period before the project owner begins to, to pay? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> the, the investors that I am uh, bringing are, are long-term uh, investors. <clears throat> it, is not, it is not bridge loans or short-term financing in terms of you know, 30, 60, 90 day bridge loans kind of thing. Uh, they're more long-term, uh, but as with all of us, we, you know, we have the short-term relationships because those are oftentimes needed. But once that, to me, that goes back to the actual partner. Uh, when you're choosing debt or equity, you're still wanting to choose someone that has, uh, has those kind of resources who, if your business, because they have a vested interest now, if your business gets in a pinch or a bind and you need a 60 day uh, cash flow issue, you know, for example, you've got a $500,000 sale that's waiting to be paid. It's already made there. You're waiting on the funds to be received and you've got a hundred thousand dollar bill that, you know, something you're going to do that's going to significantly impact your business. If you don't get it paid, then uh, that may, maybe you take out, take a bridge loan, pay the hundred thousand until the 500,000 come in. And that will be bridge loans are ugly. Uh, bridge loans, you will pay dearly on an interest rate, but at the same time, that's why it's always one of those decisions that when it comes to bridge loans, even if it was 50% interest rate, like if I had to pay 150,000 back, at least I still have a business. <laughs> it's literally, you don't take bridge loans or short term financing unless it is that critical and that dire because from a specific interest rate perspective, that's a bad business decision. From a, I'm still alive and I'm still in business perspective, it's a no brainer. In fact, it's a very big help. So uh, th that is a tool to be used, it, it, you know, in the rarest of circumstances and, and, and hopefully uh, you don't have to, but it's certainly fine if you do. It doesn't speak to your business acumen or lack thereof. Uh, it's just a fact of, of business uh, and especially the business environment, the global business environment that we're in today, uh, bridge financing uh, is, is, is needed from time to time, depending on the industry. So, and then to Grace's um, uh, a question, could you uh, repeat that for me as well, Nikon? Yeah, uh, for debt funding, is there a grace period? Once they get the money, will there be a grace period? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the investors don't want to set you up to fail. The, the investors, uh, 
most of them have grace periods. Uh, the larger the amount, usually the longer the grace period. Uh, usually a standard grace period would probably be about six months. Um, uh, but that's part of the thing that can be negotiated. You know, I have never seen one past 12 months. Um, and I think six months though, is this, is the normal and the standard. Um, and, and, but once again, it depends on the nature of your business. So for example, if they put in, uh, a $1 million investment and that $1 million investment based on how you've told them you're going to spend it, they know it's going to start producing a return in two months. Then they will probably make the first payment due on the third month. Okay. They're not trying to catch you. Remember, they want to get their money back. They want you to be successful. They need this to work. Uh, so they're not going to try and put undue hardship on you. Uh, but, and, th and also with some of these things, they're not just basing it on how they feel. You know, th there really is a method to the funding madness and investment theory. So if they agree, uh, they know how the money will be spent when the, that should start seeing a return and then have you start paying. Uh, so that depends on industry, market, location, your business. <clears throat> Uh, so, so, but, but I think that answers your question that it doesn't start, you know, 30 days after you receive the funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. I think that um, we're good. One person on the group has asked, um, what would your advice be for startup enterprises as far as funding and investments are concerned, startup enterprises, what, what would your advice be? Uh, can we find out? Uh, what type of business they're referring to because a service business, let me just say this. I believe in for startup companies today, I believe in, I really believe in service businesses, service companies. Uh, it depends on your financial standing. If you have enough resources to live comfortably without any income for several years, then you can start, a different type of business. Maybe you can take the product that you think is going to change the world or make life easier and spend several years pursuing the, that development and protecting it, you know, and, and bringing it to market. Most entrepreneurs I know can't do that. Uh, they are concerned about financing. They are concerned about how they're going to pay their, their rent or mortgage in, you know, uh, six months from now or, or any of their bills. And so cash flow is very important. And so that's why I recommend, especially for first time entrepreneurs and uh, first time business owners to start a service business because it's simple and it generates it. it it's kind of like being an entrepreneur, it requires skills, just like if you were going to become a doctor, um, you don't just open up a practice and then uh, a clinic and then start taking patients. You have to go to school. You have to uh, do a residency. You have to learn uh, how these things work. And that is the exact same way it is in entrepreneurship. There is a statistic in the United States that nine out of 10 businesses fail. Uh, in their first year in business. And five of out of that one that out of 10 that survives, five uh, of those uh, will, will, half of those will fail in their second year in business. So the success rate of businesses, uh, especially for first time entrepreneurs, is not high. Okay. But that's not a bad thing that doesn't that's not a scary thing it just this goes to show that's why the investors want to know you and your background and how the business is doing and, and and what got you to this point because if it is your first rodeo your if this is your first business <clears throat> and uh depending on where it's at that that does make a difference so for example service the best service businesses i think today they can be started for very little money 
you do not need funding to start a service business or like I said, a micro loan or something could probably help, but you do not need funding. So for example, you in the United States uh, and, and even in, in Australia or Europe, uh, places in Asia, a lot of people did, uh, you know, Airbnb, they became that kind of a service business where they didn't even have to buy the property. They weren't even renting out their own houses. They were just doing the rental management of booking and advertising these Airbnbs and in, in, in making a fee a whole lot more than normal property managers were uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, some other service businesses, uh, you know, are like laundry services where mobile laundry services even. So instead of buying a laundry mat where people go and do their laundry, uh, we have young people who started a mobile laundry business where they go to each uh, house or in a college community in dorm rooms at university. And college kids a lot of times don't like to do their laundry. They were used to mommy doing it, their laundry. And so uh, they go get, uh, they pay for people to do their laundry every week. Uh, there are cleaning companies. Uh, some people do commercial cleaning. Some people do residential cleaning. You've got to focus on one of one or the other usually, especially when you're starting off. Uh, but you can charge, you know, let's say you charge $75 or $50 per house and you have 10, 10 clients per week at $50. That's $500. You're making $2,500 a month. And your only investment was in some cleaning supplies and some rags. You're using the client's vacuum cleaner. You may be using the client's broom or maybe you go buy a broom. But those are the kind of uh, uh, service businesses. I think this global pandemic has opened up a lot of opportunity in the realm of service businesses as well. For example, uh, I think there is going to be a great need for sanit uh, sanitization companies. Uh, there are the, the big cleaning companies but they they clean well and um uh, but i think there's great opportunity for companies who only do uh, sanitization you know coming in with the commercial sprayers uh, some companies will opt to have their employees do that but their employees aren't that's not what they do their employees are working all day uh maybe they're in the restaurant business or waitressing they're good with people they're not good with some of these other things and so there will be a lot of opportunity that comes out of, uh, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic that I think are here to stay. Uh, shopping carts, grocery carts, uh, those will be sanitized, uh, I think, for the rest of our lifetimes. That's not just something we're doing now. We're starting, you know, it should have been done all along, but companies were too cheap to pay for it. They did not, a lot of them did not uh, have the awareness of trying to, of, of cleanliness. And, and so, but there are some things like that that are here to stay that give you opportunity to start a service business. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of service businesses that are stationary, like brick and mortar. Uh, you rent an office or do it out of your home. And then there are service businesses that are mobile. Uh, let's say uh, there are computer repair places or, or uh, you know, device repair shops that are brick and mortar, where there's a fixed place in town, you know you can go and get your computer fixed. There's also a lot of mobile computer and device repair services where they come to you. They'll come to your office, they'll come to your home. Uh, think about the spa industry, like uh, massage therapy, for example. Uh, that a lot of time, at times there are uh, done in, in business storefronts, and then there are massage therapy services that will come to your home or office. Uh, and those charge more. If it's a mobile service, you can charge more um, because you have drive time, which means you can't see as many customers. You have gas uh, expenses. You have wear and tear on your vehicle. Uh, so, so you have to charge more for a mobile. But that's a niche. You are, uh, even if there are a lot of standalone, to be able to have someone come to your home or office to make it more convenient. And service businesses are all about convenience. A lawn care business. It's not because I can't mow the grass. It's because it's more efficient if I keep doing my work and you do, and I pay you to do your work and, and have my lawn taken care of or to have my house cleaned or pest control to spray for 
you know, bugs or insects uh, and so forth. Uh, pest control is another great service. So, sir, I love service businesses. And I also believe that service businesses are a cash cow. And once you start a service business, it's, it can grow very, very quickly. Service businesses can grow faster than most any other type of company. Uh, they can grow like an e-commerce company or an online commerce uh, can grow very fast as well. Uh, but service businesses will give you cash faster in your pocket than even an e-commerce store would. Uh, because, and that's what service business are really about is how do I get cash today? How do I get cash next week? And service businesses are great for that. And you can get good funding for service businesses. So for example, if you own a carpet cleaning service where you, even if you have to go rent the machine and then go clean the carpets of the company or the homes that you've been hired to do that day, uh, you at some point you may say, I need $3,000 or, or $10,000 for a van that has a carpet cleaner loaded on it. The equipment's bolted to, into the, 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 the mobile unit, and I'm able to just drive that around and do things, and I don't have to rent that. that if you've already built a, a business, then those type of investments are, are, are a great stepping stone, and investors happily invest in that kind of a business. The other one is like a moving company. If, uh, if, if p people paying someone to help them move and sometimes people will rent a van from some place and they'll bring it to your house and they will load up your furniture and move things so you don't hurt your back. Uh, or so you, uh, your, your family, they hire movers uh, to do things th like this for you. So service businesses are great. Uh, I do think cash is king in those scenarios. And it's a great way to start because you're going to learn the essentials and the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, which is customer service, having a product, developing a product that people want, learning how to make that product unique. So what, what makes you different from the other carpet cleaning services? What makes your residential cleaning, home cleaning service better or different than the others? And why should we care? Uh, so it, it, I get that you, maybe you're, you're, you use all organic, uh, non-toxic cleaners. Uh, so if people have allergies, uh, your cleaning is going to be better for them than anybody else's cleaning. Those are the kind of unique differentiators that you want to, to, to think through. But yes, I love service businesses. <laughs> yeah. Now, thank you. And for long-term investments, somebody asked here, what is the upper limit number of years for repayment? Uh, so that question is only pertinent to debt financing. And uh, that would depend on if it is real estate or, or not. So let me give you a couple of scenarios. Real estate financing uh, can typically go uh, between 20 and 30 years on financing, depending on the type property. Um, so that would that would be long term. Uh, however, if the debt financing is to pay for an acquisition, so for example, uh, let's say I own a coffee plantation and I want to buy my competitor, another coffee plantation in the country. And that way it doubles my production, doubles my capacity. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a smart move and I can buy it at a good price. So you come to the investors and you say, we're doing, you know, a million dollars a year. And if we spend this $2 million, we're going to add m revenue and we'll be doing $5 million a year in revenue three years from now, if we do this. That payback period is going to be shorter than on other type of, of assets, uh, such as real estate. So um, uh, that may be like a 15 year or a 10 year repayment, but that is not a problem because of what you're buying. So the repayment period, really does 
uh, is set based on what it is you are doing with the money. It's what goes back to our very first. Uh, and that's why investors ask what you're going to be doing with it. It's not because they're trying to evaluate if you know what you're doing or not. It's not an insult to your intelligence. They're trying to understand what does a deal look like? What does us doing a deal together look like? So if you tell me you're going to do X, Y, Z with it, well, I already know you can't make payments for a year. Okay, so that immediately factors into the type uh, investment. Uh, but if you tell me it's for a piece of real estate, I immediately go, okay, I know that I've got different sources that I can get that will fund that er, you know, in payback period of 30 years uh, or so. Uh, but if, if it's to go buy another company, uh, that better pay off you know, in three to five years. So, uh, so those, that's the, the, the difference between payback periods on, on funding is really use of funds. Yeah, yeah, and um, if I would just add on to that, Dr. Roland, uh, for the sake of the enterprises and projects on the call, um, we have a very robust team, you know, um, you know, supporting all of you enterprises in the six countries. Uh, the Timeless team has, you know, legal business advisors, appraisal teams, you know, you, we have Dr. Roland, myself, who will be engaged uh, with you to just offer you advice based on the offers, the deals, the opportunities, what your enterprises are looking at so that you just get the best and most comfortable, you know, um, deal and offer for, for you as a leader for your project and as a leader for your enterprise. So, you know, just know that you have that support, the technical advisory, that business support that's going to be working alongside you throughout this process to ensure that, you know, you, you're comfortable, you have what it takes to make the decision that you will finally make based on the offers that come your way. And, and like Dr. Roland mentioned earlier, you're at liberty to, to accept or reject anything that doesn't work for you. Our objective, you know, Dr. Roland and myself and the teams that, that you know, are behind the scene is to ensure we have the most favorable outcome for everybody who's on, who's on, who's on the, the funding tour, right? Yeah, so I think um, we can... May, may I interject that to that point, uh, the investors uh, want to invest. It's important yeah. for you to know that. They want to invest. They're not bored. They're not, like I said, it's very difficult to get them to get on a plane and go anywhere. Even in the United States, they don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so to, for them to get on a plane and go to another continent, like I said, immediately after a global pandemic uh, is quite special and unreal. Uh, it's because they want to be there. They, they recognize how unique this is what we're doing and uh, you're a part of it and they are a part of it and uh, they investors want to invest so it's important to to kind of go in with that mentality uh, and it's fine to negotiate but also understand that there are some things that uh, it just has to work for everyone and so if there is something that uh, you, is very important to you, then, then just share that with them. Uh, and let them know that you're looking for more than just financial, uh, a financial investor. You know, you're wanting someone who invests not only their money, but invests your heart, invest your time, invest your connections and your relationships, uh, really have a vested interest in this. Now, if it's just debt financing, then you don't need to, to worry about those things. They're not going to, you know, you can't ask for a marriage proposal uh, just for on that debt, debt uh, financing. But uh, if it's equity financing and they're going to be a, a partner in your business and if you fail, they fail. If you win, they win. They're putting a lot of faith in you and uh, they will bring their resources. But the fact that you value their input the fact that you value their advice will mean a lot to them because, uh, and really they wouldn't invest without that. They want to be able to uh, help guide, help advise really is the word, help advise your business. If they're going to be putting in a lot of money and not knowing when they're going to see a return. And to that uh, end, before we go to the next question, I want to address, uh, the exit strategy. 
your exit, if, if you take equity funding, you need to be prepared to talk about your exit strategy. And the reason is because that's when the investor is most likely to get paid. They probably will not get paid prior to you selling your business. So they will be looking at uh, helping you. And by the way, even if you never plan to sell your business, it is a good idea to always operate your business as if you're going to sell it. Because you will make better decisions. If you build your business like you were selling it, you will keep better accounting records. Most small businesses have horrible and atrocious accounting. If you ask to see their financials, they give you scribble. They did not keep good records. Well, investors know that means you might be guessing. You don't know how much money is coming in. You don't know how much money is going out. And they want to see good, clean record keeping. Uh, and if you were building your business to sell it, you would know that the first question anybody who is interested in buying your business would ask is, let me see the financials. I don't even have to know you. I just want to see the financials. The financials will tell me most everything I need to know if I want to buy your business or not. So you have to have clean financials. So if you are building your business to sell it, whether you are, do sell it or do not ever try to sell it, you will, you will put in policies that are better because they are scalable. There are a lot of things in business that work if it's only you. It does not work if you have a thousand employees, <laughs> right? It's not duplicatable and it's not scalable. If every time there's a leak, you go plug it, that works if it's just you and if there's only a leak every now and then. But if you have a thousand people that don't know how to plug that leak, then, um, you know, then, you're going to, then you're going to have issues and your business is not going to scale. Uh, I remember uh, whenever I was a senior executive at a Fortune 500 company, uh, I did not understand this in my, the early days of my career there uh, because that was the largest. I ended up with 1,500 employees there. And uh, in the beginning, whenever I only had six employees, uh, I could go hand them a piece of paper and ask them to do this and that, uh, and they would take care of it. And then I let them come up to my office and they could come in whenever they needed. And, you know, we just were able to get things done because there was only a few of us. But when you have 1,500 people, they can't all come to your door anytime they want or you never get anything done. And no one ever knows what's going on. And everyone is operating in confusion. <clears throat> so you have to have policies in, in that scale. Now, uh, you don't need to do this if you're the only employee of the business. Uh, but as you start to grow, and get, you know, three, four, five, ten employees, you need to look at your processes and, and scale. The other example I will give you on that is whenever I, I owned, I started a string of uh, some coffee shops. And uh, whenever I had one, I did not know how many coffee shops I would end up having, but I put everything I had into that one little coffee shop as if I had a hundred coffee shops. So I had the employees have a opening schedule, a closing schedule. So before the store opens, you have to, you know, disinfect this and that, and you have to have this arranged and uh, restock and resupply these, these products. Uh, uh, you know, I had the opening and closing list that every shift had to do. I had it all of the, the how to make every single coffee drink so that it didn't matter if I was working or you were working or someone else was working, the drink would taste the exact same. See, you want that your product to be consistent. Well, if it's only you, you don't have to write anything down. If it's only you doing the work or cleaning the house or mowing the lawn or making the coffee, 
you don't have to have procedures and protocol because you know how to make the coffee. But when you start hiring other people, if your business grows, you need to have protocol and processes in place to make sure you deliver the same product every time, no matter who makes it. McDonald's was the best at this. It doesn't matter if I have a McDonald's a hamburger in Nairobi, Kenya, it tastes the same as the McDonald's hamburger in Orlando, Florida. And guess what? It is not a grill master that is making our hamburger at McDonald's, <laughs> right? We can all make better hamburgers in the grills in, on our porch and in our, uh, in our homes uh, than McDonald's, but they have been able to take people who are not cooks and by having processes, a 16 year old who can't even make their bed at home may, can make your you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner and it tastes the same every time. That's not because the employee was so good. That is because the system that the business created is that good. The system compensates for the weaknesses in your staff. So as you're looking at growing and scaling, you need to look at your processes, your protocol, and your competencies. Yeah, you, you have a good point, um, Dr. Roland. In fact, I just want to go back a little bit. You know, you, you, you talked about, you know, the investors having a heart for Africa and uh, why they, they need to look at all this uh, value that, that they need to get, you know, on the investment. And I just wanted to speak a little bit about why Africa is so special and, and why we're even doing the, the Africa funding tour, why we've titled it the Africa funding tour. And, uh, you know, for, for uh, projects that are on the call, I want us to think a little bit about the trajectory, projection and, and the history of how, you know, um, you know our continents and our, our countries have been developing and where people put their money and where and the factors that, that sort of like, um, you know, uh, influence higher, re higher returns, right? When you look far back um, in Europe, when, when Europe was developing into an industrialized economy, the, the cost of labor was low. You know, um, there was uh, factors of production, land, you know, capital and things like that. The, you know, people were moving into higher value chains, so higher production, okay, where the costs were low. And so you found that uh, the place to put in money at that point in time was that place. But as the economies began to develop, you know, it was clear that, that you know, the cost of, you know, as people made more money and people earned more wages and the economies grew, you know, the factors of production also became more costly, okay? Land became more scarce, you know, people now are earning money, the wage bills were higher, you know, policies were put in place, laws were put in place, and so, you know, uh, the, the, the cost now of doing business increased. So the, the, the return of investment reduced, okay? And by the time the economies became developed, the return of investment also saturated, okay? And then people moved, you know, the Americas took over, and you know, for decades and, and centuries, then we were developing that economy and they, they became a developed economy. And when you saw that um, you know, factors of production again saturated, the cost of production saturated, then the return of investment reduced, you know, and then it moved east, okay? And uh, for a long time, you could see that a lot of investors were moving on to China across, or whether it was products, whether it was service, they moved production, and investment into into asia you know china and, and those kind of economies and as these economies have strengthened the same cycle has happened you know um cost of production has become high china now the the wage the wage bill the average wage of which of uh, people in china uh, is 600 dollars you know uh, to to 720 dollars quite high so you find that the cost of producing then and cost of getting you know a higher it's now a higher cost for your return you know and the return of investment then is low so when you look at continentally, you know, and, and global statistics, the next frontier and actually the last frontier where you can get the highest, re in, you know, return is, is Africa, is Africa. And uh, the opportunity, you know, for untapped potential and untapped, you know, opportunities, high returns, you know, um, we've got one of the largest workforces in the entire world growing over the next 50 years. So, you know, the cost of production still being relatively low you know, arable land and factors of production being readily available. But the ideas and the creativity, you know, that are also available on the African continent give uh, Africa a very good chance to be attractive 
to, you know, to foreign investors that are coming into the continent to invest. And so, you know, when, when Dr. Roland, you know, is talking about the, 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 the pool of investors that we're looking at, you know, in, in our Africa funding tour, we're looking at people who have a heart of, for Africa, who want to be part of Africa's growth story, because Africa really is on the verge of rising, you know, into, into our destiny and into prosperity. And, and, you, and enterprise is, is, is really the, 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 the pillar on which that will happen, you know, and that's why it's so special to have, you know, all the view project owners, enterprise owners on the call already submitted your, your, your projects and ready to be part and parcel of that, that lever, you know, and of that story for Africa's economic transformation, you know, as we solve Africa's problems. So I just thought that, you know, it's good for us to, to see where we're at in this season as projects, as enterprises that are really part and, and, and you know, playing a central role, you know, in, in, in Africa's story. And as we link in with these investors, these are investors also who are looking at a new frontier to be able to, to invest, to be part of that story, to, 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 you know, get a high return and high value. And so just, just as uh, you know, we've been speaking about on the call, let us you know, come to this call you know, with that understanding and engage with the process again with that understanding where we know that we are partners who trust each other, we're trying to do the best with the opportunity that has been presented before us, okay? But also making sure that we're good stewards of all the opportunities that we're getting before us, you know? That, that for me is very exciting and to find worthy partners, you know? Like Dr. Roland and, and the teams that are involved, you know, Cecilia, Michelle, and the technical teams behind the timeless, you know, advisory. It's it's really really exciting. So I think um, some comments there on the chat, uh, Dr. Roland and the rest. You can uh, pick them on the chat. You know, good point about scalability. There's often a huge challenge. The insights given are quite quite useful. You know, so we can all pick on the the comments that are going on in the chat. I'd love to invite uh, Michelle um, now on the call to sort of give um, you know, a, a brief overview of the processes that we've been going through you know, to date on, uh, on looking at, at, at these submissions, you know, the overview, uh, the analysis, you know, your findings, initial you know, outcomes, you know, and some of the recommendations. And um, Dr. Roland, um, your head and, 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 and mind on gear, just so that you know, we can pick those insights and also share our insights um, with the project. Uh, project owners, please engage with that information that's coming through with questions, with, um, with you know, inputs and insights so that we can hopefully um, leave this call, you know, very enlightened and strengthened to, to move to the next level. And so, I also ask that uh, the, the project owners, uh, you know, if there is a question you have specifically related to your presentation or how you plan to use it, if you want to you know, run that bias and say, well, this is what I was planning on doing. How will they receive that? How will they hear that? Please feel free to, to do that as well, because I want you to be uh, ready. This is the readiness, funding readiness tour. We want you to be prepared. Uh, and so uh, this is a friendly, this is the friendly environment. You don't have to worry about uh, appearing foolish or saying the wrong thing. Uh, you share what you what you're wanting to present and how you how much you're wanting and i can even do a a trial run a mock run with you and i will ask you the exact questions you're going to get asked in august uh because of how we think and so uh, i just wanted to say that uh point and and i also want to thank uh, thank you nike and uh because uh your remarks on the why uh investors are interested in African investing, it, it, because not only is, is it the last economic frontier uh, really available, uh, but uh, in, in great opportunity, but the uniqueness, because uh, African people are loyal people. If you do right by them, there will be a long profitable relationship as the economy is growing. Uh, they, you won't just jump ship and go to the next person who offers you a better deal because you appreciate the people who were with you from the beginning and that invested in you when no one else would or no one else saw the value, and uh, but they believed in you. And so, uh, but for an, an institutional investor to invest in Africa, they do that because the they 
uh, have to, they, they consider the geopolitical landscape. They consider what the laws are, the political stability in, in, in a country. Uh, they are considering a lot of those things because many of our investments have, have evaporated overnight because of maybe political uprising or political instability in a, in a country. Uh, and so the fact that you as project owners are coming through your nation's established process in, 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 in agencies such as the chamber, uh, you know, bodes very well. It gives the investors confidence. Uh, and also because in the event of, of political unrest, uh, you know, everyone still recognizes the need for a thriving economy. Uh, no, no one wants to take power uh, with a lagging economy. You always want, to, you know, the best economy possible. And there is no better way to strengthen or grow an economy than small business. There is a re a, uh, did you know that 80% of the people employed in the United States, actually, I think it's 82%, of the people employed in the United States are employed by companies that have 10 or less employees, by small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of the American economy. And that's what grows countries. And so uh, you are the lifeblood of your country. And uh, to, to be a part of that you know, is, is just a blessing. Yeah, um, I will not tire, by the way, uh, to underscore the, the, you know, just like you're doing, Dr. Roland, on, on the importance of small and medium businesses driving an economy. You know, small and medium businesses are actually the drivers of the economy of Africa, seriously. And that's why even during this COVID period, one of the things that we're trying to look at at national level, you know, at leadership level, is, is, is obviously, you know, the COVID, um, you know, uh, pandemic has hit small and medium businesses quite hard, you know? And seeing how that is going to have a direct effect on economy and building resilience for that is key in this point in time. You know, uh, one of the things I really love, um, and you know, in this pioneer Africa funding tour, that, like you said, done for the first time, but quite happy that we are the ones, you know, sort of pioneering this thing, is to look at a practical contextualized sort of uh, process that enables us to increase our high chances of success. You know, we have, you know, Africa, you know, the Timeless Network being, you know, a Pan-African platform, you know, working with all these countries, with understanding the African context with all the people on our network, you know, and sort of bringing in, in the preparation phase, the thinking of, of what Africa needs, how Africa works, what the enterprises are facing, what kind of deals are going to, to work or not work for Africa, you know, I want you projects to understand that behind the scenes, these are the conversations that are happening, you know, to make sure that we are successful in this process. And then with Dr. Roland leading the team of the American investors and the team that's engaging from America, also picking that and sharing and saying, this is how America thinks, this is what we're looking at, this is, this is the context that, that we are coming from, you know, and how does it work and us hearing all these things. And then the teams in the back end, putting in the processes to support this, hopefully we get the best outcome. So I'm personally very, very excited to see how, how you know, this fast funding tour will, 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 will be and any of the outcomes, even as we, we, we strive to build a better, you know, next round, you know, um, next year. So China, without much ado, China, yes, China, go ahead. China, uh, you know, has had one of the fastest growing economies of, of the last, you know, 30, 40, 30, well, 20, 30 years, really. Uh, and and, and have, has risen dramatically in GDP to where they became one of the, the major economies in the world, uh, you know, in, in, in the top top five really, and top three. And and so to have, uh, and they followed a very similar pattern that Africa is just now starting, and except Africa has a major advantage because. China is, of course, as you know, starting to invest in African communities with bringing manufacturing, just like America did to China, you know, mm. in the 80s. Uh, we sent manufacturing in the 80s and 90s abroad for cheap labor, 
and, uh, and, and the Chinese got very good at that. Uh, and so, uh, but now it is cheaper for some of them to uh, build factories in Africa, uh, in different countries there, Ethiopia, Nigeria, so on and so forth. And so they are able to, 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 to grow there. Uh, but all that should tell the African community and continent is that, okay, Africa now sees us the way America saw them in the 80s. And so our economy is about to do the same thing, but how can we do it smarter and better? And because, of, because you are by and large free to, and certainly from a business perspective, you are free to start a business. Uh, because you have that freedom of entrepreneurship in Africa, you have a tremendous advantage. They did not have that advantage in China. When I uh, was in China um, a year and a half ago as an advisor on the US-China trade war, this was one of the most important points was that they, many of them still thought like employees. They still, uh, they did not believe in their own abilities to build and grow a large enterprise. They did not believe in their ability to start a business or uh, like the Germans feel. Germans feel like if they start a business and fail, that they can't start another one uh, because they tried and it didn't work. So therefore they don't think they are, that's not for them. But, you know, in America, as an entrepreneur, we say if the, if, if the, our national uh, chamber says that nine out of 10 businesses fail in their first year. And then we say, well, that's why I started 10 businesses. <laughs> I wanted to start the one that would, would, you know, go big and be successful. And so uh, as it relates to the African economy, just know that you are at the very beginning, uh, very similar to where China was, except you do not have the, uh, the laws and regulations that slow business down or you're that you're not even legally allowed to start a business uh, that they weren't able to do in China but you are able to do in Africa so this is critical uh, and, and, and those of you who are paving the way and, and pioneering you have to be ready for your mind to expand you have to be ready for uh, uh, what you may think is growth maybe going into the next community next to you. But to an American investor who is investing all over the world, growth might mean not just moving into another neighborhood in your city, right? It might mean moving into another industry sector or another market sector or introducing a product that appeals to a different demographic than what your current products do or adding a complementary product to your existing demographic, or uh, maybe going, expanding into a different country uh, in Africa, or maybe even partnering with people in Europe or America to bring African goods, you know, uh, made in Africa, uh, or made in Rwanda, or made in Kenya, to the different parts of the world. Uh, there is a global supply chain. And so if you have a product-based business, then and looking to scale and grow, then you know those are the type of things that they will be able to especially help with. But that is vision. That is vision. So when you speak to investors, you do want to share your vision, but you also want to share how you're going to accomplish that vision. And I promise you, you probably won't be able to say much of anything that we haven't heard before. So you don't want to make things up. You. Also, whenever people, sometimes I'll have uh, a university uh, person, uh, child, tell me their business idea and how, and they'll tell me with a lot of uh, arrogance how big their business is going to be and I'm going to, I'm going to make it to where nobody even has a computer anymore. Well, I do, I don't think we'll probably have computers 20 or 30 years from now or 40 years from now. We'll be using something else. Uh, but to think that uh, that's going to happen in the next two years because of their invention is not likely. Okay. So you can have a good vision and then someone question if you can execute that vision. 
Uh, so uh, you have to kind of, you can know where your business is going, uh, but also, uh, you know, investors will be asking themselves, even if you get there, is that something that the, that is worthy of being in, out in the marketplace? Uh, so uh, these are just some questions to really ponder. Yeah, thank you. You know, I hope that you all can see beyond money and everything that we have a, a passion for true transformation and, and really building the African continent. I hope you can pick it. I hope you can see it, you know? We're not just about checking boxes here and doing showbiz. We're about what do we need to do to ensure that enterprises in Africa who are key drivers for Africa's economy are getting the right support, the contextualized support to be able to grow our economy. You know, um, when you look at the, the strongest economies in the world, I was looking at the G7 and the G20 and Italy. I was in, you know, when I was talking to some, some key players in Italy last year, you know, and a group of investors, as we're looking at what is the thing that's driving the Italian economy. And it's SMEs, it's SMEs. More than 85% of the enterprises in Italy are SMEs, they're driving the economy. And then the G7, you had a strong economy like America driven by SMEs, okay? China driven by the SMEs, but moving into high value, higher value chains, production, and in industries, you know, you know, creating that niche for spaces in which you can actually get your highest return and highest value as an enterprise, okay? So um, I think for now, what we can do is, I'd love to invite Michelle um, on the, on, on to take uh, a few minutes to provide, um, on behalf of the technical and appraisal teams that are working behind the scenes, to just provide insights of the processes that have gone on so far, what has been happening, uh, the initial preliminary outcomes and observations, and we will comment, Dr. Roland, myself, um, you know, and, and others on the call will be able to, to share our insights based on that. And then feel free to engage interactively as well so that we can see how best to strengthen the next round, Kim. So Michelle, um, over to you. Thank you, Nyakan. Uh, I am representing the technical team as she has mentioned. So the technical team uh, was looking at the business from the inside out. That is the, how we do our review from the inside out is from inside the business, how the operations are doing, what is the vision, the leadership. And then we move on to the next stage, which is the immediate outside, which is the industry or sector that the business is in or the proposal will be in. And then after that, we look at the country, of course. So we look at the risks, the strengths, the weaknesses from the inside out. and. Um, that was technically what the group was doing. And it's a group of analysts. So we were very critical about it. And we categorized the proposals into three from the strengths, based on their strengths, from the one with the highest strength to the lowest, the one that requires more support. So um, what we did is we color coded it into three colors. So when you receive your results, your preliminary results, you will find that they're color coded. Um, if you find yourself in the bottom category, which is the yellow code, it's not to dampen you. It's not to tell you that you're not, your, your, um, your idea is not viable. What it means is that the presentation, most of them, it was about presentation because I understand that some were not aware of what exactly to present on the executive summary. So what we were looking at was, first of all, what the purpose, the purpose of the request, the proposal. And we would look at, secondly, the objective, the amount required, how you plan to spend the money, um, who are your clients, how you intend to face the competition, who are your competitors, how the market looks like currently, and how you you want to plug yourself into the market. And then from there, we looked at the market, of course, and we would see whether it was a viable venture, a viable idea. But it doesn't mean that what you presented was not, in fact, all of them were actually amazing ideas. Most of it was just presentation. The presentation of it is really key, even for ourselves. I would give an example of um, someone who's 
uh, proposal we thought would be strong, you know, an example of what, what a strong proposal really looked like. Um, that would be someone in the, oh, sorry, before I even get there, allow me to mention the industries that we came across. The industries were in the trading sector, services sector, agriculture, manufacturing, um, financial services, hospitality, health, and the fast moving goods, which is FMCG. So those were the basic industries that we came across in the proposals. And we looked at the proposals, also noting the issues affecting the industries, right? And before I even touch on that, I will give you a brief summary of how we were looking at it. So from the inside, the business, we would look at the risks of the business. I already mentioned that we would look at the purpose, you know, the basics, the purpose, the, the amount. So over and above that, we would look at the risks the, co the company will face, the business will face, and the clients would face. Uh, we would also look at the industry and the country. Um, and if it will be affected by inflation, like for example, those who were in the import business, we would look at whether, like right now, we know that COVID-19 has come in. It has, there's a storm right now for people in the import export business. International trade is not flowing as it should. So we would look at how, you know, how this proposal is not just how it'll not just face the storm, but how it'll handle it, you know, how the business will continue should there be any storm that it faces. We were also looking at the conversion of the cash cycle, which Dr. Nolan and uh, Nyakan have really mentioned. The cash conversion, conversion cycle is really important. Some of the ideas require a long cash conversion cycle, which means the return will come so much later and others are a short cash conversion cycle like the services industry. And we would also look at um, the, in the projections as well, we would look at how some of the, the ideas show the product projection of their cash flows. Now, some of the, in fact, most of everyone in, in the Kenya uh, submissions were very clear on their future projections, you know, 2021, 2022, all through like to the next three years or something, which, which is really great. And that is something that we look at in the next phase. Now, when we go to the, when we finish with the business itself, ah, and the directorship is also key. It's important because you're investing. I mean, this is a part, it will be driven by people and we need to know what is their expertise in the area. Dr. Nolan had mentioned before that if it is a startup and there is no known expertise of the driver of the proposal, I mean, that's, that, that gives the person a lower chance. So you need to have uh, some sort of expertise and the proposal shouldn't be a knee-jerk response to something, to anything. Some of them were knee-jerk responses and they were not clear. So we need to understand that there is actual passion in what your invest, you know, what this, this, this proposal is about. In the industry, we would look at, um, well, the industry overview, the structure of the industry, the risks the industry will face, um, the cycle in which the industry is in. Like for example, in real estate, we all know that real estate is a heartbeat kind of graph. You know, it goes up, it goes down, the bubble bursts, then it comes down again prices are low and then you know up and down so we look at where we're at in the industry and where you're plugging yourself at so that is also key because it needs to show that it needs to be clear how you plan to plug yourself at that time in the same industry we would look at um, the maturity of the industry the competition in the industry whether there are fewer players the margins are important in the industry. And just as he had mentioned, the amount being sought needs to be practical, of course. If the industry has lower margins, like we all know in oil and gas and the energy industry, the margins are lower and the amount being sought is not practical on how the repayment will come back. Of course, we would put you in a lower category because that is not clear. So how the funds are being spent is really, really important and clear and how you plan on paying back. So I will give an example of uh, um, 
of the three categories now. So some of the things that would make a proposal be viewed as a strong proposal is that the in the proposal, in the summary, the, there were a few things that were captured that really made sense to the person. You know, they were catchy. And some of the things were the idea, the innovative idea was really good and it shows that it captured, you know, it's something, it's a problem that the, that is being solved in the market. You know, it's and the person needs to show that they have either, you know, had experience in it, a little bit, at least some experience in it somehow. And uh, most of these uh, proposals, actually, if not all of them, the Kenyan proposals are really great, showing that most of everyone has experience, at least in whatever they were inquiring, whatever they were seeking funding for. The other thing would be, another thing that would make a proposal to be uh, of uh, to be strong would be the XP. Okay, experience leadership. It shows that the, the financials are strong the record keeping, which will now be looked at in the second phase. But we can already tell if there is any records, even from the first page, the executive summary, if you have included your, a brief, a brief um, summary of your projections and stuff, you know, we can already tell that there's more coming because the second phase requires that. Um, the growth, um, a robust product development, yeah, basically that. And it also in, in your in your projection and in your proposals, we can also see that there's a ready market depending on how you present it as well. Some would present on the location and how the market is ready to uh, embrace their products, and that is really important. How the market is ready to embrace your product. So I will go to cash flows, which I felt was really important. Um, in the second phase, okay, what, you, what, what next after the preliminary is the second phase, which is um, a second review, which is a dipstick review. We are going to review based on a checklist that we will share post the call. You will, be share, you will receive the checklist where it has basic requirements of what we need for the review. Now, in the checklist, Michelle, the most important... Michelle, before you go to the checklist, I think I'd love to pause there and give some room for reaction and questions and insights before you go to what we'll be looking at in, in, in that next phase. Maybe you can speak to the color codes, okay? What are the color codes, um, how, you know, what, what, and then give sort of some, some instances of, of specific, you know, any specific examples of maybe two, three enterprises not by name, but maybe by by description of, of, of you know what, how they you know how they, they, they played out in the in, in, in each of the of the color coding, so people can get a sense of how you know they're they're, they're looking at. You say there's there's green. I know you said there's blue and there's there's yellow. What what does those mean? Um, what are some of the things that you, you know um, you you observed? You know, across the enterprises that 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 were, were were categorizing those those particular color codes. Maybe you can speak to that. Um, give you some examples, and then um, maybe after that, you could also speak to some of the insights in industry, different industries, industry sector. What are they looking out for? What 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 you know in the observations of what they submitted, and what are some of the parameters? that you observed and and what what do you think is needed and then maybe pause there for some reactions and questions from the, the group before then you move on to what we will be looking at in the next stage and before you go to the next stage also maybe after you finish that questions from the project owners and then insights also from dr roland and and and, uh, and molly if you, if you if you want to give any insights and then we can move on to the next steps Okay, thank you, Nyakan. Um, I will start with the color codes. So we color coded them to green, blue, and yellow. As I had mentioned, the, uh, from strongest to the ones that require support. So the green was the, the proposal that we felt was really strong based on the presentation of the idea. Then the, we have the blue code, which is those that we feel, they're, they're just okay, they're not, they're not very strong and they're not very weak, they're just being monitored. and they still require support, but it's just uh, polishing a few things here and there. 
and then there was the yellow ones that um, where we realized that the, the idea was amazing, but the presentation of the idea was where the challenge was. So if the presentation could be worked on, because I would give an example of one where the, the, the idea was based um, on, on COVID-19 happening. And that shouldn't be the motivation, the vision, because um, after the pandemic, what, what next, you know? So we felt that the real idea behind the business was not brought out, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't clear. So we put it on hold and said that, wait, we need a clarification, clarification on that. You know, what, what is the real purpose of this application? And I would go back to the green. Okay, what, what made some applications to just stand out? I will give an example of someone who was um, uh, looking to in, invest in agriculture. So they have already been in operation for about over 10 years. So this is someone who has already been in the industry. They, they have experience, you know. So the experience already gives them a higher niche. And then they already, they can show, they have shown how their products have been embraced by the market. And so they are just looking to scale up. And they have given, you know, how they will face the competition as they scale up. They, they have, it's very clear on the objective and everything. So we just want to know more, you know, even anyone, even an investor, an analyst, you want to read more about this. So they, they were already as a strong proposal and we're ready to go on to the next phase. Um, another proposal I would look at is someone in manufacturing. Someone would like to invest in manufacturing. They would like to raise capital for a plant, a processing plant. When we look at how they presented themselves, everything was very clear, but we were not clear. I mean, it, it, it is an amazing uh, idea. However, looking at the manufacturing industry right now and the specific man, uh, plant they want to venture into, there is really low competition, but we are not, we, we, we need more convincing that they will be able to be sustainable, you get? So we need like proper cash flow projections. We need to see their financials because they've already been in operation for a few years and they, they seem to know their way around, but there's a little convincing that's needed. So it doesn't mean that the idea was, it wasn't bad, it wasn't good, it was okay. It was just okay. We just need to understand that yes, you have little competition, but how do you, how do you plan on being sustainable, yeah? And then I will touch on one that was yellow coded, which is, um, well, it wasn't strong enough, but it, it, it requires support. Um, I would look at someone in the hospitality sector. And we all know that right now, hospitality sector is, is facing its challenges, yeah? But they require acquisition of some equipment and assets to set up a restaurant. Now, the restaurant business is great. Everyone needs to eat. We love food, but we need, it, it needs to be clear on how the business will be set up because they, they showed there was lack of experience. You know, they already know that food will always be eaten by people and, you know, it's a lucrative business, but the, the, the directors did not show what experience they have had in the business. There was, according to what the proposal showed, there was no experience. So it was not about the idea, but how will they run it? You know, there's no experience. There's no growth plan. Like, it wasn't clear on anything. So it was, it, it requires a lot of strength. It doesn't mean the idea was not bad. It was a good idea, but it, it requires a lot of strength to support it because it's also a saturated industry. So. That was, that was just an example. Okay. All right. So color coding, uh, green are, you know, strong, generally almost ready. Just need a bit of more clarification. Blue is monitoring. You know, the idea is well presented, uh, you know, almost strong, but needs further clarification to strengthen it and to give viability. Um, yellow, 
you know, good presentation or good idea, but really lacking in some very strong areas that are needed to make the idea viable. Yeah. Um, and I know you'll speak to how they can all then strengthen these ideas. Uh, maybe before we go into that, um, reactions from, from you project owners, questions from project owners, like Victor Roland says, if you have anything specific from what you presented that you want to know, that you want to find out, that we can help you to go back and, and you know, strengthen that, uh, please feel free to, to take the floor now. Anyone can speak, you can just unmute and, and, and ask your question or, or share your insights. Yeah, so um, I'm part of Lambo from Malawi. I just wanted to know, like, um, um, you're talking about the color, and um, you're talking about green, uh, yellow, and blue. So I was saying, like, when you're when you're giving like, feedback, would you how can you email us with like uh, the thing that we have polished up? Was just that we've get it all from the meeting, or are going to send back the emails? as per project. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, thank you, Harris, for being on the call. Um, however, this is a Kenya review, Malawi is on Friday, because part of your, your next steps is tied to your leader, who's not on this call today. Um, but, you know, um, I see somebody else as well um, on the call. Um, who is this? Tihinyurwa Charles. Uh, I don't know where you're calling from. Is it from uh, Rwanda? But um, you know, you're welcome to be on the call and just listen in. But um, I know that the, the schedule went out with the days for your country because the support coming out of the call is tied to the leader in your country. Um, so in terms of next steps, you can listen in and just get insights from what the Kenya team are doing. But in terms of next steps for you in Malawi, I think you're going to have to wait for your Malawi call because they're tied to your leader in Malawi who's going to be able to support you on the country. country. Is that okay? Yes, but and I can I can tell you I I like him already uh, because he's getting a head start uh, and he will be further along than anyone else. Yeah. What good business owners and entrepreneurs do, they are he yeah. is already learning, and so he will, can have some things tweaked and adapted even by the time we get there on Friday. That is critical. That is one of the things that investors look for. Not someone who just already has all the answers the first time. But what is their, uh, how proactive are they? How diligent are they? How prepared are they? And so that's, uh, mm. that is great to see. Uh, there, while, while we're addressing and waiting for a couple of folks to unmute as well, to ask their question, uh, uh, Michelle, I just wanted to uh, commend you uh, for, for you know, breaking that down and your team for all the work that they've done in evaluating and providing the feedback and the support uh, and helping these enterprises be ready for to receive real funding. And um, uh, you mentioned a couple of things that I thought were, were very important and I wanted to expand on one thought and that was on the ownership breakdown. We haven't yet spoke about that, but one of the things before you get funded, every single one of them will ask and must know is who uh, the ownership breakdown, who owns what? Do you own 100% of the enterprise or do you actually only own 20% and your mother-in-law owns 80%? If so, I want to meet your mother-in-law because she's going to be my business partner more than you. You may be the one doing a lot of the work, but when it comes down to it legally, she's the one who may control more of the business than me. If, if I only have 10% equity and she has 80% equity, she calls the shots, not me. And I want to know who, I, uh, who the other investors are and so the ownership breakdown also impacts a, an investor's decision to invest in your company or not. And then I also really appreciated the, uh, the food service example uh, that Michelle provided because uh, even in the United States, uh, obviously food is, is, is something, food and housing are, are fundamental. Uh, however, uh, food products can be good. Uh, but restaurants specifically uh, are usually bad uh, for investors to invest in. Uh, 
So uh, even in America, you, the only funding that a restaurant gets is if they already have uh, one or two successful, very successful restaurants and they're wanting to franchise and open up more around uh, maybe in other countries um, or in other cities. Um, but if you're, if you have one in, uh, on one side of Nairobi and you're wanting to open up uh, a restaurant on the other side of Nairobi or in a different neighborhood, that's not going to be something that an investor will invest in, uh, not for this type of an investment. Uh, because restaurants are very risky uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but I can tell you also, the other thing that would go into that is if it is your first restaurant versus if you have been in the restaurant industry as an owner or, you know, for, or, or, or senior manager for, for 20 you know, years. That would make a little bit of a difference. But so many first-time entrepreneurs want to open up a restaurant they want to open up a cafe they want to open up you know uh, some kind of shop because it's cute or it's they know how they want to decorate it or what they want to see in a restaurant and um opening a restaurant for your first business is one of the first uh, is one of the worst investments you can make for your first business as well but there are plenty of great food service ideas for your business um that may be uh, like takeout, or maybe you are a food delivery service. So you go to all of the different cafes and people can order like in our, in America, they have like Uber Eats or Grubhub and those kind of places to where I can order from a bunch of different restaurants and uh, it goes out to a large group of people, kind of like Uber uh, or Didi uh, in China and they will go pick up my food and bring it to me for you know a, a, a charge uh, maybe four dollars or five dollars or something and and so those are good ideas also if you have a uh, a signature uh product that is able to be uh, uh scalable meaning you don't have to cook it to prepare it there's a way to mass produce your food item then you can get it into grocery stores and into supply chains in other places. But the other reason why you have to be careful on food service is because the tastes are so different by culture. So you are naturally limiting your, from an investor's perspective, the business can't grow beyond a certain size because you can, you can rarely grow outside of your region where that pal where they have a palate for your food product. Um, what the, the best sellers in China are not the best sellers uh, for food items are not the best sellers in the United States. Uh, but a Gino's pizza, frozen pizza in the United States, you know, they're not, the, the, you know, someone in, in Shenzhen or in Shanghai or Beijing is not going to put that in the microwave and heat it up for the family dinner. Part of it's our cultures are different. America's moves faster than most other countries. And so they want their meal done in 60 seconds in a microwave and China, uh, you know, maybe they have been working on it. Someone in the household has been working on the dinner for three or four hours uh, every day. And that's kind of the role. Uh, and they would almost uh, uh, feel it a disservice to their family to do something faster. So the very thing that sells in America could actually be an insult in China. Uh, as it relates to food, uh, but certainly as it relates to taste and uh, palate. So that's a very interesting dynamic when you're looking at uh, the food industry, restaurants, uh, and so forth. Good, good insights. Um, good insights, uh, Dr. Roland. Thank you so much. Uh, Maureen, would you, would you, I see you have some comments which, that you have for uh, Michelle. Would you take the, the mic, Maureen? Maureen? While Maureen is doing that, and, and uh, I see he's trying to, probably trying to find right. uh, unmute. I think he just found it. Uh, I see oh. that Maureen, uh, go ahead and tell us what business you're in. I see you're in the entertainment industry and what your objective is. So 
wrap all of this into into for Michelle, if you will. Mm -hmm. All right, sure. Uh, I think what I'd like to know is just to get an understanding of um, if it is more of a startup. Uh, Michelle, this question is for you. Perhaps uh, what would be your advice? Yeah? If it's more of a startup, probably the, the directors don't have that experience, but it's an idea that's uh, it's a concept that can be sustainable. Yeah. What would be your advice in terms of uh, making sure that the proposal is firmed up? Yeah, I think that's what I would like to know. Okay, all right. Um, are you in the entertainment industry, Maureen? Are you in the entertainment industry? Yes, it's a conglomerate. It's entertainment, uh, stroke hospitality, stroke service. Yes, so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a whole idea that's supposed to be executed as one. Well. Okay, and uh, can you speak a little bit more about what, 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 what your desire is for, for this in the time of the next level and uh, why you're even looking at uh, submitting you know, this idea for investment? Do you want to speak a little bit into that so that Michelle, Dr. Roland and others on the call can be able to give you some insights um, regarding your submission and what can strengthen us? Sure, sure. You know? Yeah. Sure. So uh, basically, we looked at the market uh, where we, as we put in our proposal, the market we're targeting is um, there is such uh, the, the, the more or less such designs, but not as complete as ours. So we're looking at uh, disrupting the market a little bit. So uh, the entertainment section, uh, basically offering entertainment and then hospitality and also just having like more of a, a fun park. Yeah, so to speak. So I'd like to know uh, from uh, Michelle and probably yourself and Roland, what exactly should such an investor uh, probably put into uh, put at the back of their mind when they're trying to uh, pull together the proposal? And what are the factors that probably need to be uh, put together as at now before even the proposal goes to the next level? Just say that again. Say that again. Okay, sorry, I can't probably see the network. So I'd just like to know what advice would be given at this level as we prepare the proposal so that it can be strong enough for the next level. Yeah, mm -hmm. being that probably it's not something that's been uh, there before. It's a new idea that needs to be put into practice and the concept is really exciting. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roland, you can go and Michelle, then I, I will follow. Certainly. Uh, well, I, I, I like your vision um, and your idea. My, my question here is, uh, I, I, I see, I think I see what you're trying to go for. It's almost like a, a small Disney World there or a, a theme park, kind of maybe a fun park uh, where there's different rides or different things, entertainment type things. Uh, you know, depending on if you were focusing on families or uh, just children or young people, you know, I, I would want to know where, which target you're, you're marketing. Uh, or which market you're targeting, and then also I would want to to know uh, what do, what do you do now, uh, and uh, do you already have land? Do you already have uh, where this is going to go, and you just need investment for rides or for infrastructure? Um, do you already have this market, or and you're just moving to a bigger place? You know, can you expound a little bit, uh, you know, on, on where what you're currently doing or what you currently have? Mm -hmm. uh, Roland, sure. I think that's great. So currently I work as a HR manager, but basically I do, uh, I have a passion for entertainment and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and allied stuff. So I've been doing that on the side, but I really want to transform the idea into real uh, actionable concept. So together with other partners, we come together with the idea and would like to do it basically to attract family, children, you know, and a larger, uh, to a larger extent, different people, not just family and children, but yeah, incorporated in and, all and, that. And do they, do they need to stay overnight? Or is this a, uh, something they do in half a day or a full day? Or, you know, because, you know, safaris are obviously very big in Africa. Uh, I plan to take a one day safari uh, while I'm there. Uh, there's actually, but there's a lot of three day and five day safaris. Uh, so how, how is yours uh, just somebody would enjoy your entertainment facility for a few hours or is it a multi-day? Uh, because that multi-day is a lot harder uh, sell for people. You have to have a whole lot more for them to 
travel, you, you incur the accommodations for lodging, you know, and so forth. So what, what are, where are you playing in that space? So basically we want to have, uh, I think both. So we have the short term and the long term where we can offer um, probably camping, uh, camping facilities uh, for future camping facilities. And then uh, looking at the area, basically we've not seen such kind of a facility uh, in the area. So we want to provide a facility that can disrupt the, lo the normal entertainment hospitality market in the area. So it will include probably having the, the, the lodging facilities in terms of camping or rooms and then entertainment all together and then a fun park. So it's, a, it's all in one, yes. And, and so you don't have land or location presently, right? You're, you would be seeking in funding in order to buy land and build infrastructure, I, I suppose? We already have land. So what we're looking at is, uh, what we're looking for is infrastructure and probably uh, infrastructure and execution to the end, but we already have the land. Okay, that's great. That means you're a step into, yeah. into it uh, and it's not just conceptual. So that is, is very good, that's encouraging. Um, the, the next step that I, as an investor, would, would really want to understand is, okay, let's say you have the land, Let's say we gave you the money to build the infrastructure. Uh, uh, how, how do you be competitive? Um, because we really don't know what price points, that, because like you said, this is different than other fun parks. So what price point are, is your audience willing to pay? You know, um, are you gonna be priced too high? Are you gonna be priced too low? How do you know how to price you know, if somebody wants to do the fun park but not stay the night in camping or in rooms or so forth, um, uh, is the location uh, some place that is hard to get to? Uh, and so, even though everything is wonderful and it's priced right, will people actually come? Uh, so, what are your thoughts on on those points? Uh, for the location, I think we are. We are, we are primarily located uh, in terms of uh, access. For the price, we, 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 we're looking at being competitive, not really high and not really low, because I mean, there has to be return on investment at the end of the day. And we're also looking at segmenting the pricing, as you just rightly put it, that those ones would want to come around probably just for a day, that those ones would want to come and come. So having different price ranges, depending on the, on the services we're going to offer. And uh, yes, we, know, we want to create a niche for ourselves in terms of being um, different, as I just put it, from the normal uh, service, uh, service industry or rather hospitality industry that's around there. So I think it's a well thought through idea and uh, probably uh, as we move from the executive summary as we'll be guided, we'll be able to give more insights around what are the, the marketing um, channels that we intend to use to make sure that we are really afloat, yeah. Do you expect to open up, uh, is part of your vision to have these fun uh, entertainment hospitality spots in different countries uh, around Africa and kind of become a, a, a middle market uh, entertainment spot? Or what, what are your thoughts? Are you just trying to build one and that's kind of the end and that's it? I think for now we, we're looking at building one in Kenya uh, that really stands out. Not really thought about expanding to different locations, but just one that really stands out and can give us the return on investment. And right. also still uh, make sure that our customers still have something to talk about when they leave the place. Okay. Now, just for illustration services, I want those listening to understand uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, this would probably be more of a debt arrangement uh, than a equity arrangement because if she's only wanting to to have one location, one really good location, um, that's okay. But for an investor, that's not uh, going to provide a, a big return. And if I can put a hundred thousand in a in something that's going to give me a ten times return, versus something that's going to give me a two times return, uh, you know, I'm going to take that same hundred thousand and put it in the other business. So, uh, uh, so. In, in her, what I heard from this, I can deduce that, you know, this is probably a debt financing deal, not an equity deal. But if 
she was wanting to open up more in different parts of Africa. And maybe it's not for 10 years until the second park opens, but uh, or entertainment spot. But if that's not kind of on the roadmap uh, for the distant future, um, and really plan to do that and, and that be a burning desire. Like we're building this first one with excellence in order to go to this next step. Uh, you would get more funding at that time for expanded growth in other countries and other parks. But um, uh, that would be an equity play. That would be equity financing if you were looking at doing that way because that's a long-term view and a long-term relationship of how we want to build the entertainment hospitality sector in Africa. Uh, and there is a market for this um, uh, where it's not the Disney worlds and the, and, and the sea world and the major uh, theme parks around the world, but they are the smaller entertainment spots to your point, whether it's, you know, go-karts and putt-putt golf, uh, miniature golf uh, and uh, batting cages and, you know, petting zoos and, you know, what, whatever mix of things you have where they can just kind of stay in a restaurant where they can eat while they're staying there in a cafe and uh, lodging. Uh, so I can, I, I see your vision. I do believe that that is, that it's viable. Uh, that's the theme park industry is usually seen as risky and, but, uh, but the way you're, you're presenting it and the fact that you already have the land, um, I, I don't I don't see it as a as a major investment risk. Um, there are the questions that I present, presented as will people come, uh, and the accessibility and the price points of that, um, and how it compares to other entertainment spots. Maybe they, the other entertainment spots don't have lodging because people don't want to do lodging at that. They just want to be able to go and leave, um, and so there may be a reason that hasn't succeeded or maybe it's going to be the next biggest idea, you know, in Africa. So uh, I do think it's worthy. Um, but I also believe that uh, if you're going to put in all the time, money and work and, and to build one with excellence, uh, then even if you don't have enough energy to personally open more in the future, at least you would have a template for how to open and how to launch a new entertainment center that you could franchise out or some, you know, someone else, you lend the brand and the blueprint for doing that. And they open up, you know, whatever your brand is, your name in their city, and they pay you a, a, an upfront fee for all of that. And then they pay you monthly a royalty based on the percentage of sales uh, that they get. Maybe uh, usually it's between two uh, and 4%, something like that. So the two or 3% of, of sales every month, and that's for you to continue to advise them or to, for them to be a part of uh, new things that you come out with at your park. But, um, but, but that's how you're meeting needs across the continent and thinking like a, like a, a really a big business person, even though you would be a small business. Yeah. And um, again, for, for Maureen, um, in addition to what's being said and the rest of us who are on the call, how are you uh, embracing the need for convenience? You know, right now we're moving into an era where convenience is key. We're also looking at the role that technology is playing. Okay, so how are we embracing technology um, in our businesses um, to just enhance some of these things? Uh, Michelle, do you want to react to Maureen's um, thoughts and questions? And anybody yes. else who's quick to speak, um, please feel free to, to put your hands up and, uh, and share your insights, your questions and your thoughts. Hi, Maureen. So I have been listening to what the idea that you have, and it, it, it shows that we do have other themed parks that are similar like that in the country. I believe you're from Kenya. In Kenya, if you're from Kenya, we do have such themed parks. And our question, like in our review, what we would look at most is not just your cash flow and how you expect cash to come in. It's how you will bring the customers in to you know it, it ha what's your marketing strategy how will you convince and sustain you know and keep your clients that's the most important thing because they are the cash 
they are the cash that will pay all your returns and everything. So it's it's more of how do you plan. And then you said you have core directors. We would also be keen on knowing, does anyone have any experience in such hospitality? You know, it's really important that you have some experience or are you planning to go on some sort of training you know just as dr nolan said if you want to be a doctor you need to go to medical school so if you want to be in the hospitality industry being in hr is amazing because you already deal with people and that's great at least you understand you know how to deal with people but in hospitality you need to understand how to play with our minds to be able to come back you know catch us how, how are you planning on holding on to your clients should they arrive you know how are you sustaining that yeah okay as we look at that there's somebody else two people on the on the chat um uh, pauline you're talking about your business in every business you can take the mic and uh, and you know share the insights the questions you have for the mm -hmm. for the panel um in the meantime um alice asks what currency should we use in the proposal the currency is in us dollars just to standardize you know we all understand the us dollar requirement to convert uh, the currency to US dollar amount so that we can know this is the amount being asked in US dollars. Is the call closed or can one submit a concept before 10th of July? Well, now that you're on this call and you're getting the, the insights, you have a chance to, to submit, uh, you know, strengthen your, your, your proposal or submit a new one in light of, you know, the feedback that you're getting and the ideas that you're getting. So feel free, um, to, you know, to expand that uh, beyond what you submitted. So Pauline, uh, Marima, you can take the mic and, uh, and share your question. Hi everyone. Hi. Uh, you've, you've called our police. She's just stepped aside for a second. Sure. Um, we've we've been in agribusiness for some years now, and um, we have experience in production at the primary level, and also have um, customers uh, who are who are buying. Just to go a bit behind to explain ourselves. We've done contract farming for um, some of large large corporates, some of the millers, and also the largest brewery in Kenya. Uh, we've also moved to, we've done some livestock, um, mostly beef, fattening, and, uh, and sales, and uh, tried to do a bit of production of our own um, feedstock, and that comes in with the uh, beekeeping for pollination. Although on a, on a not a very big scale, um, not, nothing that is done in the US. Um, and our proposal is to, to scale, um, move from where we are now into some level of value addition and also increase the stock that we are working with. Uh, we appreciate uh, the livestock business has a shorter cash cycle uh, than the other agri business, um, and therefore returns would be faster and even the reinvestment. Now, um, the proposal we put forward, listening to Michelle and uh, Dr. Roland, um, we indicated that we are by and large a startup because we are looking at uh, mechanization. If we look at the, the number of staff we are taking are not too many. Uh, most of this will be mechanized. Um, so in that level of experience, we don't say have it. But going to the likes of uh, other large uh, investors worldwide or uh, successful businesses, they would employ or hire people with that, with that expertise. Um, and if they don't perform, you replace them. You keep and you grow. Um, so are we a startup or how do we be rated? Our, our look, are we also seeking both equity and debt? Uh, of course, if Kenya opens, the airways open, we improve our quality. Of course, the US will be a market that we want to sell to in the future. So Michelle and Dr. Roland, um, are we, would we be a startup and how do we go about this? Thank you. Michelle, please. Uh, hi, Marima. So, um, if you have been in business and you just want to scale up, 
we wouldn't look at you as a startup. You have some experience, you've been there. So what we would look at is, what is this scaling vision you have in mind? And how are you planning on executing it? So basically, you're not yet a startup. It's, it's about the presentation of how you're scaling up. It's about the presentation of how you intend to use the funds allocated to you and how you see the return coming. And also being in agribusiness, um, it is advisable to, like, like I, I, sorry, pardon me, but you said that you intend on um, exporting. Kindly clarify on the, the customer base that you're looking at. Uh, Pauline is actually back. Um, we already are in touch with um, customers and those who have route to market in, within the country. And uh, we see opportunities uh, where they've reached out to us for, are we able to do more? Can we preserve, prepare more? Um, and we don't have the capacity today because of funding. Um, but as in our line of business, uh, whether it's beef or veg, um, I'm sure as we, part of the scale up with quality, uh, product assurance, going Ken Gap, Euro Gap, and so on, to hit the export market. But that would be in the second to third year as per the proposal. But in the first year would be to, um, let me say market capture and have that learning curve before we actually begin exporting. So that is not immediate right now, uh, but that will come subsequently. Our proposal was in three, three parts. Um, and uh, we, when we come to the detailed conversation, proposal by proposal, we'll be able to show you exactly what, what, where we, how we intend to go. Okay, so now that you've clarified your customer base, your immediate customer base would be locally. And you said that you have already identified who you were planning to sell your product to. And as an investor, as an analyst, what I would look at is how concrete, uh, you know, you, you could be, you, you might be having an idea, but it would be nice to cement that relationship by having your clients, because if you're scaling up, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's no longer retail, you know, it's in quantities, in bulk quantities. So if you are able to cement some sort of um, documented, uh, you know, um, either, not, not, it could be a contract, it could be a, you know, a performa invoice that if you say, you know, whatever sales agreement you can have with these guys, that, pardon? Even letters of interest or to buy exactly you... letters of intent, letters of interest, any you know whatever documentation documentation you can show that can support that you actually do have a customer base. Should you be able to scale up, you know, and the timelines you're looking to scale up, so that will also you know quick show the agency in the fact that you're also committed to it and you're looking for a way of committing to your vision of scaling up and you're serious about it but i will let dr roland speak more about that yes marima thank you for your uh remarks and and michelle for the clarifications that you've uh extracted your business uh you know the story when it comes to investment the companies with the best story, the, the, the best storytellers are the ones who ultimately get the, the, the investment. And so if you notice, we're having to talk about different pieces of each of these businesses. And what I think one of the objectives is, uh, which is why the executive summaries, which is why the checklist and so forth, is to help you put together the story. It's how you tell the story of your business. So, and I actually think that your story is stronger than what you've presented. So this is a case where I think it's actually probably a better business than what it currently sounds like. And I'll tell you the difference, okay? So, um, and, and from what I heard, how I would share that story is, 
that you started an agribusiness several years ago. You said you've been in business several years, several years. Uh, you've had an agribusiness. You've had several divisions of your company. You had beef. You have, uh, you know, be uh, beekeeping and because of with pollination and so forth uh and you have you know different uh, you know additional uh, animal based products and uh, you know that you that you are able to provide what you have discovered during this time uh is that uh, your most profitable well actually you didn't say the word profitable so you would but you would be able to state what the most profitable product you have is but you said that the from a cash flow perspective, that beef is the uh, is the best cash flow product that you have. So one of your growth initiatives is to focus on uh, more beef. So what we need investment for is I need to buy, right now we have seven head of cattle and uh, that produces X amount of calves per year that uh, uh but we need to really grow our herd to x amount so that we can uh our sales will you know increase three four five times uh so so really that's almost like an inventory funding uh we are needing to grow our the physical assets that directly produce revenue um now i don't know how you're planning to use the revenue but that's the kind of story you you start me where uh, where you've been and where you are and then br then bring me up to date with where you are. You know we're doing a uh, hundred thousand dollars in revenue. There's four employees, uh, two of them are part time. They just as we need them, they're not just you know draining the bank account uh, when when they're not working. Um, and you know we we focus on this uh, product line during this season of the year, and then you know this. But the bees in this season of the year because they're really active and uh so there's seasonality to it but the area of our business that we think will have the most impact and grow the revenue x percent uh or by x amount of dollars is in beef like you said uh and so this is how much money we're asking for and then that amount of funding will purchase x amount um and so then the question is you know do you already have the space for it um, I'm not concerned that you would be able to, you know, you'd be able to hire more people. Uh, I don't think that that's, you have to hire people that are highly skilled and trained for years. So you're not going to have a labor shortage. Uh, but, but those are the kind of things that I, I you know, I'm thinking about uh, as it relates to your business. Yeah. Yeah. Marimas, um, does that, does that shed light? For your questions and uh, and your preparation yes it does yes it does thank you very much yeah uh you know as we're using your examples maureen and marimas you know and as the rest of you also want to bring up some of the ideas and and, and questions you have around your enterprises remember you know investor project sort of link linking and linkages is not just about uh, one plus one in black and white a lot of gray area that are relational you know it's a chemistry it's a story it's someone buying into that story you know buying into your vision the passion you know michelle ashley say talked about passion are you able to demonstrate the passion for your own idea you know are, are you able to captivate people with your story you get it and and is that story a story that is bankable you, you understand so you know looking beyond the the dots you know the black and white and the dots you know and the t's and i's it's looking at how are you presenting how are you telling your story? Are you present? Are you giving the best, you know, um, case for your idea? Are you presenting it in the best way possible? Because you're the you're the only one who can tell that story. We can help you prepare. We can share all the insights we are sharing. But ultimately, you will stand before the, the, the you know the the, the, the investor. You know, uh, one time when we were, we were doing um, a similar call with some entrepreneurs, and um, one of uh, you know our technical team members was telling the entrepreneur enterprises and which is very true you can be you can be a, a whole room of people males can to blind it we can do all requirement looking for what kind of room and we fill the room but ultimately you have to you know, make sure that the chemistry works you get it so you have to look at this as a, as a, as a you know all the preparations that we are making 
ultimately you will make the presentation as a business owner, the project owner, and tell that story in a way that connects with that investor, with that person whom you're looking at. So keep that in mind. It's not just it's not papers that are going to be pushed. It's going to be relational as well. So there's going to have to be some, some sort of chemistry. You can have a very good idea that's punk. If the investor just doesn't like you, you just don't like them. There's no chemistry there. You know, it may not work. Yeah. The idea could be a good idea, you know, bankable, viable. But if you're not able to have that connection, it could also be. Yeah, that's correct. And one thing I would say as well, uh, Marima, is think through how you are adding value in addition to your normal uh, protocol. So for example, in the United States, there's a big difference between grass-fed beef and uh, those that have been injected with hormones and growth hormones and so forth. Uh, so really think through your strategy, even beyond the high level fundamentals, um, because sometimes not that uh, we're going to go there. We just want to know that you go there. We want to know that you think more about your business than I think about your business. You've thought through it more than I can in 30 seconds and poke holes in it. Uh, but you have really thought through. And at some point, you're going to have some additional differentiating factors. Uh, especially as it relates to if we, when you're talking about exporting, they're going to be thinking they know that people are health conscious. And, and so things, being able to say things like uh, grass fed, um, you know, uh, or, or, or all organic, uh, you know, those kind of things are going to be very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I broke off there. I don't know at what point I broke off, but uh, thanks for picking along. And, and we can move on. Yeah, so anybody else with a question? Michelle, do you want to react um, on, any, on anything there? Michelle, I think you're on mute. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, I think you have said everything there was to say about the investment proposal. Can I take the floor? I had my hand is up, but maybe it's not visible to the convener. Yes, uh, go ahead, Alice. Yeah, this is Alice. I want to reflect on Dr. Roberts' uh, earlier uh, highlight that uh, it's not just all money, and also Nyakan's uh, uh, idea about the chemistry between the proponent and the potential investor. And I have this one question. In the whole package of financing and support, would the package include these two components? One, technical assistance. Because in some investments, uh, like mine, I'm in agribusiness, wanting to move now to value addition, developing but. Uh, uh, convenience foods like a snack from uh, certain uh, tubers and, and the technology is, is there and uh, would the package of financing include technical assistance and would that be counted as part of the financial value being injected into a business that is my one question question number two is where the investment in, involves value addition. It would require equipment. And uh, sometimes in the light of our concerns of climate change now, the technology may be a solar powered uh, cold chain uh, uh, equipment. This is just for the sake of demonstration. If an investor provides such equipment, would that be counted as part of the whole financial package being provided? or? there be in kind and, and and related to these two questions if um a proponent or the person who has developed the proposal has their systems on the ground set and all they're lacking maybe is some additional uh, more efficient e equipment or machinery to use would and uh, bringing that in kind not cash uh, be considered also just as the necessary support needed for such 
uh, a business to move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you, Alice. Uh, some initial thoughts, and, and you, you had very articulate questions that I appreciate. And so I'll answer them, um, and, uh, and if you need to further clarify, please do. So the, the investment agreement um, will not contain a technical uh, advisory component uh, as well. Uh, that's more of a relationship. Uh, that's when they you call or have phone calls or emails or messages, um, you know, and things like that. You know, for example, Nyken and I work together on projects, um, but uh, but and we have certain arrangements. But however, we don't we don't have a contract that states uh, that we will talk to each other a certain amount of times. Uh, a week or that we will email once per day <laughs> you know or things like that so there is a flow to that communication that is not in any in an agreement uh, but that is just relationship um, and uh, if I want to address a couple of the specific scenarios you said if you were going to buy a solar powered tractor for your agribusiness uh, if, if the, the investor, if he paid for that, they would consider that part of the investment. Okay. So if you took a $300,000, you know, whether it was debt or equity, um, uh, and paid for that, uh, that would be part of whatever the financial arrangement is that you all agreed upon. All right. Now, if, however, he, he knew someone that could uh, uh, that wanted to donate a tractor. Uh, maybe they're upgrading their current fleet, and they're getting rid of some of their their older machines. But they wanted to donate them to to a worthy agribusiness in Africa, uh, and he facilitated that. He would not get payment for that, and it, there would not be a cost involved. That's just a a a. a you know, a, a value add because he was, that person was the investor. Uh, so that would not be coming out of the actual investment dollars. And that's what I was really speaking to of what other value can they provide uh, besides money? Uh, because sometimes uh, I can give you $300,000 or I can help you get a contract that guarantees you a million dollars a year in revenue. Well, depending on your business, that's probably, that's a much, that's a lot more valuable than me giving you $300,000 and you hope you do $300,000 in sales. So uh, that that's kind of the perspective. Does that help uh, clarify, Alice? Uh, yes, it's great. In fact, uh, in business, I would, I would want to get, take that market contract that you're giving me than having the money. Yes. Because <laughs> it's yes. more sustainable. And it can uh, enable growth. Right. You see, you're exactly uh, so right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you're exactly right. And and investors look for entrepreneurs who understand that, because if I threw those two things out, and someone wanted to just take the cash, then they're probably not a good business to invest in. See, so the fact that you understand that provides more confidence in the investors that you know what you're doing you know how to run a business, you immediately are able to understand what is, what makes sense and what would be a good decision. Okay, yeah. thank you. If, 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 yeah. Since I'm on the floor, if you allow me, this is also a very general question. I think it can benefit all of us. Uh, we have Kenya-US relations and looking at the global market and how things are evolving, uh, you know, in terms of trade. Uh, I know for Kenya, we are having a bilateral U.S.-Kenya trade agreement being negotiated. Uh, we also have the Africa free trade uh, agreement now in force because we, had, we got the sufficient number of uh, party signatories on board. Uh, my question to Timeless and to, to you, Dr. Roberts, is that in the whole package, once 
I assume now uh, an, a proponent has now gotten the, the financing. Uh, within that, how will we move forward to, no, this is not the way I want to frame the question. Let me think quickly. Okay, is there opportunity within this uh, business relationship between the proponent, Timeless, and uh, yourselves in the US to uh, enable a market expansion for an investor? I give an example. I am uh, growing organic soya and processing organic soya to feed into the feed manufacturing uh, area, specifically chicken feed. And therefore, my chick the chicken of my customer will be branded as organic chicken. I will not be the person selling the chicken, but in the value chain, I am providing some very important ingredient that gives a high value of the final product that goes to the market. Now, I want to go to the U.S. market. Will Timeless and yourselves in the U.S. Uh, facilitate identification of market niches that will appreciate the value of organic chicken and therefore link us up. Thank you. Well, I can tell you from the, from the, for that, the end of that question, uh, yes, an investor who invests in that uh, would, uh, would be available to assist in that. Now, uh, they will not go research who you should be selling to in the United States. They're not going to, you know, uh, 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 find, uh, find potential customers for you. However, if you come to the investor and say, I want to do business with this chicken farm and with this farm over here and this one, which they're well known, anybody can Google them on the internet. But whenever you find a few targets and then you come and say, do you know anyone uh, at this farm or this farm or this chicken farm that you can introduce me to, uh, then they absolutely will. And then the other thing is uh, maybe they are on the uh, you know, uh, Association of Chicken Farmers, the National Association of Chicken Farmers in the United States. Uh, they may have access to the, uh, to the agribusiness in unique relationships here that will open some doors for you as well. Uh, so it depends on you doing the research and asking them specifically if they have anyone. Um, but I must tell you, I really like your business. I think that um, it's a very unique uh, uh, niche and it is an important part of the supply chain that I actually like better than other parts of that supply chain because uh, there are very established chicken farms and chicken providers that you would have a hard time competing with. You're certainly not going to become the sole supplier for Kentucky, for KFC, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or for uh, a, a um, Chick-fil-A or something like that, a major restaurant chain in the world uh, because of, of, of size. So it's very difficult to compete with those because it's not just about the chicken. It's about the, you know, the transportation, the logistics, the, you know, the manufacturing plants. So the fact that you have uh, almost a fertilizer for the feed, you know, or something that helps it, uh, them mature faster or grow faster or an organic way of doing this uh, to enhancing the feed, uh, I think is a an incredible support item. I have I have seen it work very successfully in um, in horticulture, uh, both on growing mahogany trees and uh, in growing uh, cannabis and other uh, types of uh, fruit um, uh, products, fr fruit trees. And so, in each one of those scenarios, uh, a a stimulant, a natural stimulant, uh, is very effective, and can obviously produce a return faster for your clients. So I think it is a safe investment. Um, and then it's just a matter of, of, of logistics and, and sales. I would throw out one, uh, because it's organic, this should not, this should be a, a mute point, but I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention this, but the question would have to be asked, you know, are there any ingredients that uh, may be, uh, uh, not able to enter the, the you know, the a, a foreign country or, you know, things like that. So if, the, if, if it wasn't all organic, if there was a chemical that was not allowed or a substance in there that was not allowed, you would just want to make sure that you're, the ingredients that you're putting into the fertilizer, if it is not all organic, uh, you know, 
are able to be imported and enter the country. And I speak from experience on this, uh, Alice, because when I was CEO of the hoverboard company, uh, they blocked at at one point they blocked all imports of hoverboards because you know ninety five percent of the hoverboards coming in the United States were were uh, knockoffs. They were fraudulent. Uh, we owned the patent. Uh, so ours ended up getting blocked at the border too. They didn't know the real thing from the, from, uh, you know, just from looks from and packaging from the uh, uh, fake products, the knockoff products. So, uh, you know, we had a, a very difficult time. Even today, globally, there is a difficulty, a global supply chain difficulty in moving uh, lithium ion batteries. Okay. And the more powerful the battery, the more difficult it is to move. If you're shipping smartphone batteries, that can be difficult, um, but not impossible. If you're trying to move lithium ion batteries uh, to retrofit your car for, for power, uh, you're going to wait months and months and uh, it will be very expensive and it might uh, be illegal and not be allowed in the country. So um, I just mention that as a caution, as you develop your products for international expansion, uh, that you do consider that element. And Thank you. We have Beth uh, that has a question as well. Beth, please. Thank you. Um, before, my question sorry, before Beth goes on, before Beth goes on, I just want to respond uh, to Alice. Um, you know, on her question on how we plan to support. So just going on on to what Dr. Roland has said about um, you know. Is it going to be possible for you know her produce to go into the U.S. market? And obviously, Dr. Roland, you provided a lot of insights in how that could happen. But also from a bigger perspective, is to look at who are you engaging with in terms of choosing the investor. Okay, the initial question that was posed: somebody will give you a million dollars, or somebody will give you know in contract, or somebody would invest at three hundred. When you're on the ground engaging with these different investors, be looking at your long-term strategy you know, what it is that you want for your business, your future plans for your business, and who is the best fit for you for that. And that's why we have the Timeless Network, you know, the technical experts, advisors, you know, the legal people uh, together with Dr. Roland and his team, just to support, you know, those decision-making processes, okay? Now, I want to speak a little bit into, um, you know, the bigger scope beyond the funding tour that Dr. Roland and myself have put in place, okay? We're looking at uh, tying in additional interventions for enterprises to be able to build their, their businesses and enhance their businesses for growth beyond just investments, okay? And these are going to be touching on things like product development, you know, access to markets, access to information, you know, um, the growth strategies, the business models that you need. And, you know, as we get closer to the tour, you know, once we finish the tour, we will have different institution, institutions and projects that will be at different points in that pipeline. So if you have additional needs, like you're looking at market segmentations, you know, growing a business expansion, there's going to be additional expertise that you can access through us, okay, to help you to meet that. And then through our network, you know, wherever it is beyond what the investors are going to be giving you, beyond what you have, uh, you know, been able to lock down in terms of offers and agreements and relationship, we will see how better to support and what that shape and form looks like at the time. Okay, so just to give you that bigger, bigger picture beyond funding to a sort of perspective that we're looking at, those are some of the ways that we can help. And then, um, you know, once a year, uh, the Timeless Platform hosts an annual conference um, in, a, in, a country, in a different country every February. Uh, 2021 will be held in Malawi in February. And uh, that means, you know, different leaders, men and women from different sectors with, you know, um, leaders from all over the world, people like yourselves, business owners, you know, government leaders, you know, across all different sectors, you know, to look at what do we need to do to, to be able to, to, to build collaborative partnerships, interventions, and models that will work for Africa's economic and social transformation. That takes place over two to three days, you know, um, in, in February. However, what we're doing to enhance this partnership and the value to enterprises uh, Dr. Roland leads, uh, you know, the Africa Diplomatic Entrepreneurship Summit, which is in partnership with Timeless, that will be, you know, uh, running a two-day fully, you know, fledged uh, enterprise-related summit that's looking at beyond investment, 
you know, other things that enterprises require. So, you know, you know, your marketing, your growth strategies, your models, all those things, and having an opportunity to showcase and even meet people beyond the investors that will be in the funding tour, you know, the UN, you know, other investors, corporates, top, top leaders, who can be your markets, who can be your partners, who can be all those things. So just keeping inside of the loop of what we're doing beyond the funding to one, you will have information at the time when this information is made available so that you can then hand pick and pick what you feel is relevant for your growth and your desire for growth. Institute or enterprise project, okay? So just keep an eye on that um, in addition to what, uh, you know, has been shared on the group and in addition to what we're doing with the funding tour, you know, that we meet some of those, you know, very specific um, niche, 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 niche questions and, and, and needs for your enterprises, yeah? So I hope that really, not just for yourself, Alice, but even the other people on the call, that provides, you know, a broader view of where it is that we're going. We, we have, a, a, you know, a very broad view, uh, you know, as to what it is we want to do power African enterprises to be able to thrive, to prosper, and to be able to contribute favorably to Africa's economic growth, okay? Yeah, so Beth, um, you're on next. Um, you can actually uh, go ahead and take the mic and, uh, and share your question or your insights. Thank you, Nathan and Robert, Dr. Roberts. Uh, my question is actually related to what you've just said, uh, the additional technical assistance, but I'll mm -hmm. just uh, highlight one that uh, you didn't specifically mention. For agribusiness, and I've been in agribusiness, uh, we usually contract smallholder farmers uh, for production purposes. And to meet the requirements, the market requirements for international markets, you have to invest uh, heavily in, um, in capacity building of the farmers, just to ensure the food safety requirements are um, attained and other quality certifications. Now, if we are going to scale up, it also means we need to scale up uh, the number of farmers and probably the regions that we shall be in. At, at what level does that, uh, do the investors, would the investor be keen to invest in that or is that part of their technical assistance? And where do we, dis at what point do we discuss that? Uh, no, that that would not be part of uh, the technical assistance. They they really, as it relates to, because they're not familiar with uh, your city, they're not familiar with you know a good move versus a bad move, or which farmer is more you know likely to be successful, or this type of soil is better than that type in this part of town. So there may be there's a nuances that they rely on you to kind of know your business, um, mm -hmm. and you know where you should be contract farming. And, but I can tell you one of the things that they think about is as you're gaining and adding contract farmers using their investment dollars, perhaps, but as you're gaining, uh, getting more contract farmers on board, uh, did you think through contingency plans? So what happens if uh, there's a rainstorm that wipes out, you know, the farmers on the east side and so you're, you want to have some on the west side or in a different climate in case you know, a hail a hailstorm wipes out a crop or something. So, having different uh, contingency plans for different scenarios that could happen is a is a uh, is a, a an encouraging and a thoughtful way of doing it. Unless part of your niche uh, is that it can only be grown in a certain part of the world, and you know, and you're trying to get as many contract farmers in that one specific area to produce for you. And, and that is fine as well, but they would rely on you to identify uh, additional contract farmers and you know so forth. And, um, and then, and then you, the difference is the investment would probably, uh, you know, this would be up to you to decide how to, what to tell the investor. But in terms of what I would want to hear, it would, it would be something along the lines of, uh, uh, you probably need to increase your processing capacity in order to handle. So you may be able to go out and get new contract farmers every day. They're happy to sell more product, you know, uh, th that they produce to you. Uh, but what is your capacity to process it, uh, to handle it, and your turnaround time? How fast can you sell the product? Uh, because, you know, just because you have more contract farming, we don't want you, and even if you can process it all, we don't want a bunch of inventory just sitting 
you know, in your warehouse either or in your agribusiness, uh, you know, do you have enough demand from the customers to support that? And so that the timing of when I bring on new contract farmers uh, and is it equivalent to the demand uh, is important or do I, are contract farming relationships three, four, five year agreements? And so you have to kind of think more long term than, than just the equivalent of contract farmer to demand. So those are some of the considerations that you would definitely be asked so that they would better understand what they would be investing in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Beth, does that um, uh, answer your questions? Do you have yeah. any other request or, or suggestion on that? Um, I was more looking okay, at, thank you. Thank you. at that as part of the mm -hmm. supply chain that uh, mm -hmm. in, when you have a business, you have to think through because if there is a weakness on that and it ultimately impacts on, uh, on your business, if you have the processing capacity, uh, if there are quality issues that will be raised and, and the quality will be raised at the market end and, and that still needs to be guaranteed. Uh, therefore, you have to invest even at that level or support the investment at that level in one way or another or partner. Okay, so Beth, what I'm picking from you is, um, you know, you're trying to, 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 to ascertain whether the investors coming in will be able to give insights on value chain mm. development, supply chain and mm. value chain development from exactly. a technical standpoint? Yes. And the answer would be absolutely. Uh, an, an investor that's going to- Is that what you're driving at, Beth? Just what you've said, that uh, it's uh, hello, what the- said. Yes. Hello, that, Beth. Uh, hello, can, hear you, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you, Beth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what okay. I'm saying is that uh, uh, Dr. Okay. Robert had mentioned that uh, we look at beyond the finance. And uh, that's what I was looking at, that uh, finance alone, uh, without that now technical support, there, there is a weak side. And uh, as an entrepreneur and uh, for SME, it's, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Beth, uh, and, and I do believe that an investor that would invest in, in that business, they invest because they have, uh, they may not have, they should not have as intimate of a knowledge of the market as you do, but they do have uh, good relationships and a broad understanding of the value chain there and can certainly uh, you know, make uh, introductions. And the other component to remember with it, all of these investors as it relates to the value on the, uh, in addition to the monetary investment, is is that uh, the credibility that they can bring to your organization? You are able to then talk about that uh, so and so and such and such organization has invested in you, and uh, and here is who they are and the kind of access that they have, and um, ultimately, you know, investors are people, and people. Uh, invest in companies are people, businesses are people. Uh, so, and so ultimately this is people investing in people. And so when you talk about uh, who else is on your team, the investor is a new member of your team. So that will be great uh, leverage for you, even with new potential clients uh, that will value having someone of their caliber on your team. Thank Absolutely. you. Understood. Good. So Beth, what's going to be important is as you engage with the different investors that you'll be, you know, you'll be talking to, is to be seeing who has the money that you need, but who has the technical, you know, um, insights, strategic insights that you're looking for to grow your business, you know, the network, you know, some of those uh, very, you know, subtle but very important things that people tend to ignore is looking beyond 
beyond what 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 you know beyond the money all right so so yes. maybe what we can do is is uh, come back as whoever has a question please feel free to put your hand up or to chat on the on the on the chat box there so we can pick you up and um, and you can speak but now i'd love to just invite michelle to sort of begin to look at the next steps what we need to do to build and strengthen our submissions further the different checklists and if michelle you can really go through those um you know deeply uh, so that they can understand the industry requirements and give just perspectives, general highlights, you know, and um, what's good to have, what's a must have. Um, if I don't have the, the things on the checklist and if I don't have the things on the, on the, in the industry requirements, then what, how does that affect my submission or my chances and things like that. So over to you, Beth. Um, Dr. Roland, I think um, the, the, the documents that, that Michelle would love to, 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 to talk about, I think, are, are emailed to you. Maybe you present, because I don't know if she has presenter um, rights. Um, maybe, Michelle, you could try. But if Roland, you could help us uh, with those, that would be great. So. Super, thank you. Yeah. So, Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Nyakan. So the next step is the second phase review, which I had mentioned earlier is a, a deeper review, deep, deep review into the business operations, uh, projections, and the current, pro, you know, the, the current phase that the project is at. So with that said, we prepared a checklist, which has basic Sorry, Michelle. Sorry, Michelle. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have a few uh, people who side chatted me and asked, um, what about if we are on idea stage? It's an idea, a good idea that we want an investor to invest in. You know, speak also to that when you're looking at the, the, the checklist and Dr. Roland also, in light of the pool of investors that we're having, let's think about the people who are saying, we have ideas or we're just starting up, but we think that ideas are viable and, and you know, attractive to investors. Maybe you can also speak to that as we, as we you know, go on to this next stage. Yeah. Sorry. Back to you, Michelle. Okay, sure. So back to the checklist. So in the second phase, as mentioned, we have the checklist. Now we have a checklist which is, which has basic requirements because invest. Um, the, the analysis should be on something that is almost growing. However, Dr. Nolan will talk about the ones that are just ideas and don't have supporting documents yet. Um, I will speak to the ones that have supporting documents, which where there is like the legal statutory documents, for example, um, certificate of incorporation, directors, pins and IDs, the basics. So Dr. Lo uh, Roland kindly project the checklist so that I can walk them through it. Uh, can you try to share your screen? Pardon? If you would uh, go ahead and share your screen, that would be fine. Okay. Um, uh, just a sec. Before we get to that, um, Dr. Roland, are you able to comment on the ones that are just ideas as I prepare the projection? Yes, yes. Uh, so the, the ones that are just ideas uh, would not be appropriate for this uh, for these investors or for this kind of uh, funding tour I think things are ideas um, uh, because they're looking for established businesses not may, not may not be big businesses but they're just they're established you've been in business you know for a uh, for a period of time and and you've shown some success um, this isn't kind of a, a, an incubator where you're just bringing ideas uh, however, uh, I will say that uh, the uh, African Diplomatic Entrepreneur Summit that we host with uh, right before the Timeless Conference uh, in February, that is a good place to come uh, with ideas because you have a number of thought leaders. There will be some investors. There will be political uh, folks and, and government leaders. And... Uh, you have to get good at vetting ideas. Uh, and 
I can sit here and take idea after idea after idea and determine and, and know fairly quickly if it is likely to succeed or not with or without investment uh, based on if there is a market, based on where, based on who is doing it, based on, uh, because the problem is, here's the thing that I want you to understand when it comes to business and entrepreneurship is that there's hardly any new idea in the world. Okay. So it's not so much of how good is your idea. Uh, it is, what is your ability to execute on it? So I, for example, when I was, you know, 22, 23 years old or whatever, and I was thinking of a, I, I was tired, I couldn't afford to change the tires on my car. Uh, and, um, and, at the, and, and there's, so I wanted to think of why do tires only last, you know, 50,000 miles or something. And, uh, and then it's because of the interstates and the road and it grinds it down and, so then I started thinking, well, how do we have better roads? And then I thought, well, nations spend billions of dollars on transportation infrastructure. So, uh, and they have to repave their roads every, you know, 10, 15, 20 years because of potholes and poor inf road infrastructure. So what if I had a product that uh, was able to piece together, so I was able to build roads faster, rain, snow, and, and natural elements could flow through it and, uh, and, and it'd be fine and it not tear up the road and tear up cars. And you know, so it saves billions of dollars. So I had this great idea of how to, uh, that would be cheaper and last so much longer for transportation infrastructure. Great idea. The problem is, my my 22 year old self was not the one who could execute it not because i couldn't come up with the product not because i couldn't manufacture the product but because there are a lot of government regulations there's a lot of relationships there's rfps there is a uh and especially in technology one of the questions we ask ourselves is what is the changing cost so for somebody to switch switch uh, from what they're currently using, whether it's a technology or a provider, and to switch and start using me, I may be cheaper, but it may be expensive for them to switch over. The other major concern is user adoption. Uh, if I have to train people on how to use my software or technology or how to this new way of driving a car that they've never done before, if there is... Uh, user uh, barriers to user adoption, then that's a major component. So it, there's a whole lot more, may, uh, there's more factors that go into your idea than just the merit or the need, consumer need for it. And then there are some needs that are still needs because there is not a, the, a, a financially viable solution. The solution costs more than the problem creates. And so that's why we still have problems today that could have been solved 30, 50 years ago, but it's because the expense to solve them is, is, too, is far greater than just the cost of the problem itself. And so things do come back to economics, not just ideas. Um, uh, and, and ultimately I go back to what I see most in ideas is the I, I there are grave concerns if, if that person can execute and i'll tell you why because if you can execute if you are indeed the person who can execute your idea you would already be taking steps to execute it you would be doing everything but the things that cost major money or you would be doing it in small doses you would you may want to build uh, you know, an entire infrastructure for an entire country, but you have three feet of road to show me. But, it, but that shows that you are committed to that idea. What you don't want is what they call tire kickers. People who are just batting ideas around of, I think I've got a great idea that's gonna make a lot of money. And people come and they pitch their idea and they're so convinced it's going to make billions of dollars and they're gonna become, you know, uh, very wealthy and, and because of this great idea. 
And what you realize is that uh, most of the successful products and services and companies in the world, it was not because they had a great idea. It was because they executed well. They are not doing something that nobody else had thought of. They're not necessarily doing, uh, there's other competitors, you know, uh, Microsoft, or excuse me, uh, uh, McDonald's, like I mentioned, is very successful, but there are Burger Kings, there are Taco Bells, there are KFCs, there's many other restaurants. Um, and so it's about the execution, not that you're the only one in the industry and nobody else is doing it. In fact, there may be a reason no one else is doing it because we know that it's not cost efficient or we know that they come and go all the time. Uh, and you just aren't a seasoned enough entrepreneur to understand that yet. You have to know where to apply your time and, and how committed are you to that idea. And most people uh, ultimately are not committed enough to their idea uh, because they have not taken action steps uh, on their idea. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you've given a very good brief on um, on where we're at with the funding tour, the objective and, and the kind of um, enterprises that we're looking at. And right now we'll be moving to, to answer what are the next steps moving out of here? What are the next steps? What, what, do, we, what do we take from this call and how do we strengthen those proposals? So Michelle, um, are you ready to share your screen? Are you ready to go up? Yes, uh, can you all see my screen now? It is coming through right now. We can see it, Michelle. Okay, fantastic. So this is a checklist of documents for project owners to submit. And the first document we want is uh, the application stating the kind and value of assistance required. I believe it's the executive summary. However, as we discussed, some of them were not very clear. And I believe after this, call we will all be able to hash out the areas that need um, fine trimming so that you can explain your proposition very well very clearly and sell your 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 project the second thing would be well it's a it's a well documented project proposal or feasibility study you find that over and above the executive summary some of us do have a project proposal i mean if you have if you are trying to get into a manufacturing uh, in, in a, a processing plant that's manufacturing of course we require i mean step by step proposal of how you intend on doing that how you intend of purchasing the equipment until the commissioning until you know until everything pans out and you're able to give a return on your investment so we need a feasibility study if depending on your project I mean, in the services industry, you're, you might not require a, such a, a feasibility study because it might be you know, very straightforward. However, we will require other statutory requirements as uh, required legally. We need a certificate of incorporation of the existing um, parent company that is behind the project because some of them are pivoted from existing corporations. So we require whatever legal document you have showing that you have registered for the project. We need a memorandum and articles of that state corporation. We need our passports of the directors or IDs or ID copies. Since we're dealing with Kenya, we would have the national ID copies of the directors or passport copies, tax certificate of the directors and shareholders, uh, CVs of the directors and shareholders. Again, it's also important for the directors to show that they have some experience in the industry. So the CVs will come in handy. Um, now we would require current management accounts. We need to see some books. You know, like what, 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 what where are you at currently? What are your cash flows looking like? How are your profits looking like this year? And current would be 2020. I guess because we are already media and um, some of you might still not have audited accounts for 2019 so we would still take management accounts for 2019 
But if you have been in existence for over three years, we would require audited accounts or whatever accounts you have, but audited are more preferable. Hoping that the project has, has been alive for a, a period of time. Uh, we would require cash flow projections. Now, here I would like to, I'll get back to that because I would like to touch on that a little bit more based on the proposals that we've reviewed and what we've noted on the projections. Um, number 10 on our list is um, entity having obtained its sole name, all approvals, consents, authorizations, licenses, certificates. If you're in construction, you know the relevant licenses required, you know, from the EMA license and stuff. And if you're in hospitality, you know the licenses required. Medics know they need to provide from the medical board, you know, all the licenses required, depending on your industry. Fact number 11 is important. Sources evidence of equity contribution. Seeing that Dr. Nolan has clarified that this is not really about um, ideas, it's, it's about something that is running. So you need to show what have you put in? What is your loss? You know, should all this, you know, what, 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 what is your risk? Yeah, as a project owner. So any ev uh, documentary evidence is really important of your equity contribution. Certificates of all mandatory contributions, that being tax related, all mand mandatory tax related contributions. Uh, environmental impact assessment. This is applicable to those who need it. Like I said, it depends on the industry. Proof of legal registered address. It is important that there has to be, I mean, like even in our certificate of incorporation, there has there is a registered address there. So if there is any proof, it could be a utility bill. It could be from, some of you have um, lease agreements from the landlords, wherever you have leased for the office or for the plant or for, whatever you have that proves that that's the, the, the location where the business will be operational. Number 15, we have ID documents of the member of board of directors. Sometimes we find that we, we have a different board from the shareholders, yeah? So if, if you have that, we would like to, to see that. And senior management. Senior management being the people who actually are on the ground running the operations of the business. Proof of address of members of the board of directors. So board of directors, I mean, whatever you're able to share to prove that you are legit and it's not, you're not shell. You know, some of the board of directors, yeah evidence is really important for that because the investor would like to know that they are going to bed with someone who exists so that's basic those are the basic requirements for every investor as i said previously you need to have the maximum number of documents that you can submit on the basic checklist the more transparent you are the more trustworthy you are. And yeah, that's basically it on the checklist. Before I move into the next step, kindly, if you have any questions on the checklist, you can bring them up. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Just to kick off the questions, um, you know, I'm sure there are lots of people who have been asking, um, what if I don't have number one to 16, what happens? What, what, what What's my chances? What's, you know, what if I have some of the documents and I don't have some of them, then what, you know? And then maybe speak to, um, um, number 11. I think speak to number 11 a little bit more, just to provide clarity. How would someone document if they're a business owner, you know, they started the business, the business has been running, say for example, the agribusiness shared by the Marimas, you know, um, how would they document the contribution and the value of that contribution to date to be able to demonstrate that this is my contribution to the business as I'm seeking this kind of funding, you know? And then number two, if they're seeking, let's say, um, $200,000, do you also want them to say out of that $200,000 what it is they're bringing in or, or, or you know, how do, they, how do you want them to present that point 11? Um, pardon, please repeat the last part. 
Yeah, um, I was asked, so just give a clarification on how you would love them to present point number 11. If there's a business owner, for example, the, 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 the Marimas who have shared that they're in agribusiness and um, they could be looking for investment, how do they quantify and document their investments to date, what they've put it into the business? Okay. And if they're asking, say, for two hundred thousand dollars, do you also want them to state what stake they're putting in that, or or not? You know, just give a clarification on what you expect them to be doing around point eleven. Okay. And then point those of you who have questions, feel free to. Yeah, go on. Okay, point number eleven. I will start with the bottom part, which was if if you need two hundred thousand dollars to kick off your project, um, how much you have, uh, you need to state how much you yourself are putting in in the investment so that we are clear on how much you really require yeah it needs to be clear on how much the gap costs it needs to be very clear on that so if it's two hundred thousand dollars but you actually need one hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars let that one be very clear that i have already invested i have already bought plant and equipment worth x amount i have already done this worth X amount and I just need a deficit of X. That needs to be very clear. Uh, because it will also strengthen your chances of either moving you up the ladder on the coded, because if, if, if you ask for $200,000 and your cash flows do not support that, you see it reduces your chance, but yet the truth is you only needed $127,000 and your cash flows actually support 127. So it actually increases your chance on your transparency on the contribution required. Then I'll go to clarification on evidence of how you have contributed. Now, if you have bought plant and equipment, you have documentation related. If you have um, paid some suppliers, you have your invoices. If you have whatever you have done, you have something that you paid for, unless it was on a cash basis and you know a, that there wasn't receipts, there wasn't paper trail, of which I believe that Dr. Nolan was clear that record keeping is important. So if I would suggest that you seek all the paper trail you have showing your equity contribution, what you've paid for. That really matters. Yeah, uh, is that clear on the evidence? Yeah, I hope it is. The project owners, this is your time to, to speak and seek clarity and ask the questions because this is what you'll be building on, you know, moving forward for the next round. This is Alice. Uh, thank you for that elaboration on terms of requirements. Um, on apportioning the, the contribution of an investor, of the business owner, uh, what happens if historically you invested and uh, got a building whose value is now very high, can even be much higher than what you are requesting, but the, real, the, the reality is, is the liquidity which is an issue you have got, uh, you want financing to enable you move to the next stage. How does one get a valuer to value the building to give it its current value or would we, as in bookkeeping, give it the historical value? I don't know. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, if it is in construction, I'm sure you have estimated value right now you can estimate where the building is at in the market and how much it would sell at comparing to its neighbors within the location so you can work with your estimated value for now okay thank you the other question is on uh, evidence of registered address uh, if the registered address for my business is my residential address, is there a problem with providing my residential address? And that is the, 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 locality, the, lo the address from where the business is run. 
No, that, 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 that's not a problem. If your residential address is the one, I'm sure you have, um, I don't know, receipts from your landlord, a lease agreement, something that would prove or a utility bill, water bill, you know, something that proves because you're the one and you need to state that the reason you have provided that because as you can see, the checklist has um, four columns and on the fourth column you state, you know, you need to state what you have submitted, why you have submitted it and why you haven't also submitted. So you can state there that you have submitted this and it's because your, um, your resident is your office. And I believe we have Mary with a question as well. Uh, Evelyn is fine. Can, can I ask if we are going to be sent this checklist? Pardon? Are we going to get this checklist? Yes, yes. You, will, you will get it. Okay. Yeah, after this phone call, you'll get all the checklists, all the next steps with clear instructions of what to do. You'll get that via email. Marima, did you have a question? Yes, this is Pauline. On the equity contribution, my question is, is land uh, acceptable as equity contribution either in whole or in part? And um, in terms of uh, title ownership, uh, what is the requirement? Okay, land is acceptable because, I mean, it's part of the project and uh, the title you need to state where you're at. If you do have the title, if you're in the process of acquiring, just state where you're at in the process of acquiring the title. But if you're acquiring, you do have a copy of the title, right? Yes. Yes, you can share a copy of the title. Actually, you should share a copy of the title where land is used as evidence of equity. Okay, thank you. Another question? Okay. There being no other questions for the moment, I will move over to, we have a second list of industry requirements. This list is not limited to the things that are here because each investment is unique and it might have extra documentation to support it. But these are the basics. And I will start with um, construction. Now construction, I have number one, we have basic KYCs. Now basic KYCs are all in the basic checklist. Tax identification number, certificate of incorporation, all those things are in the basic checklist. So those are the basic things that we require. Over and above that, we do require any current litigations that the company is involved in. Yeah, it's, it's actually important to, to note that. Um, another thing would be tax clearance certificate. I think we already said that. There's a company profile or project feasibility study, depending on which and where you're at in the project. We have um, audited accounts, management accounts, which I had mentioned. We have a list of aging debtors. So if you're already in business, you have already uh, supplied or sold, you need to share your current debtors because your debtor management is key to an investor. You know, if you don't collect your money, how do you, you know, get cash for your operations? So it's, it's really key and important for you to share that. Um, any technical references of works performed in the last years. So this in construction is also really important. Otherwise, if this is the first one, it will be looked at as a startup and a little more scrutiny will be required based on your R&D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a bill of quantities for the current, which is the cost of construction for the, the current project. We will need profiles and professional certificates of the project managers, surveyors, and engineers. Professional indemnities from the architects and engineers. Uh, we will need a list of major assets and equipment currently owned by the project owner, an environmental assessment certificate, and other statutory licenses as per, that are required in your country. So that's not limited to that. If you have like um, previous projects that you have done and you can show how you were paid and how, you know, how it panned out. If you have a list of clients that you have supplied to before and you know that their names would make good for you, you can do that. Just share it so strengthen your portfolio. We have the ICT sector and we have the basic requirements, which is number one, two, and then the third one was the company profile slash project feasibility study. Um, again, if you're in any litigation, it is important to note that because an investor needs to know. Uh, the audited accounts, management accounts, all those who are there. And qualification, experience of key personnel. This being a services uh, sector project, your qualification mm -hmm. is important, of course. Your experience is also very important. It is good to state what you're doing, where, where you're at in the industry. Trading services, again, we have the basic requirements and then I will skip to number three, economic diversification drive certificate where applicable. Only if it is related to your project. Import export licenses, if it is related to your project. Um, the rest are all the same actually they're all under the basic requirements and it's not limited to this if you're in the trading sector and you have other documentation that supports your project kindly share as well healthcare sector basic requirements are mandatory over and above that we need licenses of course of the key personnel that they are licensed to practice we need licenses uh, medical board licenses for the practice itself as well and any other statutory license that you you need and evidence if you have if you already have equipment in if if it you know like if you're a dentist and you have equipment ready or anything you have just share a list of assets and their values services again the basic requirements as for the checklist and any other qualification licenses that you need. Hospitality has the basic and you might need something extra like food handlers health certificate, any professional guide certificate, occupation permits, environmental audit reports, NEMA permits, all those are required over and above. And if you are in tours and travel business, you will need copies of logbooks, you know, proof of ownership that the vehicle or machinery, you know, for contract or hire, vehicle inspection, your latest vehicle inspection reports, and any other uh, related to the tour company. If it is um, air or sea, we have the airworthiness and seaworthiness certificates. So just as I had mentioned, let it be related to the industry. The rest are as mentioned in the checklist. I will scroll down to agricultural sector. Uh, we have import export where applicable. We have AGPO certificate where applicable. I will skip the basics to, I will skip the basics to animal transit permits, import permits, aviator related premises, licenses, horticultural permits, livestock permits, dry drain permits, all those permits that are required legally for you to trade, basically. Moving over to the manufacturing, we have the basic requirements and then over and above that we need full information and details of the products being manufactured. It is important to understand the products that you're selling that are being manufactured. We require 
the statutory licenses that come along with the industry you're in that you're manufacturing in yeah over and above that the rest are all in the checklist financial services again i will just skip to the statutory like governing body licenses rba ira banking licenses where applicable qualification and experience of key personnel yeah those are the extras over and above and anything else that supports your project mining the same case environmental assessments professional indemnities from the architects engineers and anything else that supports the project i think that's it those were the major industries that we captured if anyone has has not heard of uh, requirements in their industry i would like to to know now if we have not we have left out anyone Any questions on the industry Great, Michelle. Any thoughts, Dr. Roland, um, on the two documents? I know. I think uh, it, it's very explanatory, um, you know, for for everyone. You know, this is really. Uh, these are things that, as, as we mentioned before, you want to have in line, whether or not you were getting funding, whether or not you ever want to sell the business, just the exercise of bringing all of these things together and being organized will help you think clearer, make better decisions for your business uh, when you have things this organized. Uh, this, is, this, is imp this is important to the health of your business regardless. So uh, these are not hoops that you have to jump through uh, to, just to get funded. These are kind of the basics of any business that you start. These are the things that you uh, put in place to begin with. And then you have your, your, your organized system. And so that, I think that's important to understand uh, if, if you're looking for why do I need certain things or why do we need it this way? Uh, just know that that is not, uh, you know, be, for busy work or uh, things along those lines. It's really uh, the way you would want to start any business and keep things organized. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right, M Maureen. Mi sorry, Michelle, you can go on. Yes, you can go on, Michelle. Okay, that said, done with the checklist. We expect that you will submit with your checklist and all the, the documents, you know, supporting it. Um, we shall review and we shall be looking at, as I had mentioned when I started, that we're looking at the, the, the proposals from the inside out. You know, it's important. What, what is inside the business is more important than outside, and it will determine whether that business will survive any storms that come its way, you know. Um, so we shall be looking at everything in the checklist and from the inside out is, is um, the operations, how you project your cash flows, which I would really like to touch on immediately after this, and and the management, the management is also important. So back to the cash flows. Um, on the cash flows, what we expect to see are a detailed cash flow for the next 24 months. The next 24 months, we would like it month on month. On month on month would mean your inflows, followed by your expenses, followed by your net profit or loss. Now your inflows are your incomes. So if you're in manufacturing, you would probably have different incomes from the sale of your products. If you have byproducts from the sale of your byproducts, if you have waste material that can also be converted into money, again, from the sale of the waste material, 
whatever your total income is. However, you also need to project that you will receive the funding. So you can project that in the month of October, you will receive $100,000. Please put it in your inflows. Yeah, let your inflows rise by $100,000 that you have received in October. Let us see a breakdown in the next step, which is the uh, expenses or operational expenses. Let us see how you break down that $100,000 in the next 24 months. Let us see how you plan on spending the money because that's, it's very key for the investor to know how it's going to be broken. You're going to, of course, some of it is going to be a bit deep. They might not get into intricate details, but as the analyst, we will look at that. We will look at that to strengthen your case. So we will look at whether the funds are being di directed well or diverted into non-project related uh, other projects, basically. <laughs> so please break it down and then mm -hmm. let us see the spread. Now, another thing you need to capture in the expenses, at the bottom of the expenses, is how you plan on paying it back. So that's also an expense to you. How the, the amount you pl plan on paying back so that your net profit is less what you're paying back. So if you want to pay back um, $100 every month, it needs to be practical that you're going to pay back $100 every month of X amount. And we can see that you will still survive because at the end of the day, the, the amount given to you needs to show that we will give it to you. You will be able to invest in this and you will be able to make a profit and still pay back your investment because it's not, yeah. You need to be able to make money from the investment. Do we have any questions on the cash flow? Any questions on the cash flow and the breakdown of it? Okay. All right. Um, I believe there's none yet. However, we're still available to assist should you come up with, should you have them later on. So we will share the checklist and the industry requirements, which is basic industry requirements. Provide as much information as you can. Um, as you were told, you are dealing with another person who needs to just understand you and understand what you want. That's basically it from me. Over to you, June. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Michelle. You, you had mentioned that you're going to talk about management. I, I think you've, you've just missed out or, or, or you're okay with that. You talked about that you will talk about- Management, uh, the key personnel. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Just, yeah. The key personnel, uh, I had captured that a little bit in the checklist when I was looking at the checklist. It's important to share who your key personnel is, of course, because we will require their legal documentation. As I had uh, mentioned that we require CVs, um, IDs, uh, tax certificates, at least to show who the management are and what their experience is in the industry they want to venture in. That that is really key or, yes, that is really okay. key for the management. All right. No, thank you so much. And you know what's, what's interesting? I just want to commend you for the great work, uh, Michelle, you've done with the technical teams and, and the appraisers. Uh, thank you so much for that and the insights. Um, I just want to touch on what uh, you've just finalized with and what uh, Dr. Roland has, has highlighted. That these checklists and these requirements are, are basic. This is what we should be having naturally. And you know, it reminds me whether you're going for debt, equity, or even grants. You know, these, these are some of the information that they still look at. I mean, we've gone for grants over and over again, and this is the same information. Even those people just giving you money you know, to use, they still want to know that, that even though you will not pay it back, how will it be used? How have you set yourself up in a, in a way that guarantees that that money is in safe hands to deliver 
an agenda, whether it's impact, whether it's you know expansion or whatever. So you know, just want to to really um, say that for whatever reason, whatever the outcome, this is a good you know stage to be at in this process, and this is an important stage to be at because it gives you an opportunity to actually relook at your business and strengthen it, strengthen you know the foundation so that the building becomes stronger and can go higher. Okay. Um, so so thank you so much, Dr. Roland. Um, any thoughts? Any insights? Any 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 feedback that you'd love to give? Uh, I, thank you. I would say uh, for them to be prepared for very, uh, to know your numbers, know the numbers of your business, because the way uh, uh, investors in America and in Europe, uh, and, and increasingly even in Asia, the way they are approaching this is you may have 60 seconds to say what business you're in. You know, I'm an agribusiness and I deal in beef and I deal in beef, uh, pollination and so on and so forth. They give you 60 seconds to say what you do. But they very quickly will say, what is your annual revenue? What's your net profit? Meaning after expenses, so you might make a million dollars, but if you spend a million and one dollars, then you, you're really losing a dollar a year. Right. So, uh, or you, maybe you're only spending a hundred thousand a year and you're making 900,000. So you have a big profit margin. Um, so they want to know what your top line revenue, your gross revenue, then they want to know what your net revenue is. And that's helping them gauge, are you spending more than you have coming in? And if so, they're going to wonder what your plan is for managing those expenses, getting those expenses under control, or maybe you have to, maybe, some industries, the expenses are flat, and it doesn't matter whether you have 10 customers or a million customers, this is the cost. So the key is to get more customers as quick as possible. There's also uh, a phrase that I want you to be aware of. Uh, many of them will say, what is your CAC? What is your CAC? And of course, it's the cost of acquisition. Uh, cost of customer acquisition. Uh, if, you're, if, it, if I'm doing Google, uh, AdWords marketing and um, I can get, you know, that might be seven or eight cents per click on my website. And I know that, um, you know, 20% of the people who click on the website will add something to their cart. And then, you know, 3% uh, uh, will abandon their cart. And, you know, so that percentage will end up buying the product. Then I'm able to talk about that. However, if I'm doing that same business, but I'm doing something along uh, sanitization or anything related to COVID at this time, the keywords, uh, if Google will even approve you, which they just started approving last week, uh, certain business to run ads related to any COVID support or services at all, and it was 10 to $20 per click, per click. Not, not, uh, so that's, and that's could be somebody who didn't even mean to go to your website and just for that mm -hmm. click. So you can imagine, and you need to have thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks. And if you're paying 10 or $20 just for the click, you're, you're out of business before you even start. So, uh, understanding, uh, what your top line revenue is, what your net revenue, uh, net, your net profit, uh, that helps us to kind of gauge what your expenses look like. Uh, and then when you tell us how much money you're looking for, we're seeing if you're, if it fits to Mich what Michelle spoke about, does the amount you're asking for uh, relate to your current size? Or if, even if it's much larger than your current size, is, it, is that the next logical step for your business to take? Okay, maybe you're only doing 100,000 in revenue um, but if you bought the hotel next door, uh, it changes your whole business. And, and, and so you need a million dollars to purchase the hotel next door. Uh, that is, a, that is more, uh, that is okay and acceptable. And is not just based on, well, if you're only doing a hundred thousand, why are you trying to buy this big, you know, thing over here? Because if it's of the logical next business step, it's okay that it's a big step as long as it is the logical next step, business step. Super, super. So I just want to give um, one second for, for anyone who wants to react or say anything. Otherwise, if it's okay with everybody, Dr. Roland, I think it's been a very you know, healthy, very insightful, very enlightening 
um, a session of engagement with our entrepreneurs this, the, 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 you know, today. Uh, Michelle, you know, wonderful representation of the technical and advisory and business support teams that are working behind the scenes to bring out what, what you have observed, the recommendations and, and, and some of the recommendations that you think uh, need to go into, you know, strengthening these submissions further. Yeah. Um, any last uh, comments from the project owners? Anybody with anything to say? Any last thoughts, any comments? Yeah, Alice, you said very informative uh, session. Thanks for the insights. You're welcome. And thank you for being uh, very engaged and, 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 you know, really adding value to the call. Thank you so much, Alice. Anybody else? Yeah, so thank you so much. I know that you, there's a lot to digest. I know that we've, you know, we've been on a, almost a four to five hour call um, today, really digging in deeply um, into these insights. Yeah, Paris, thank you. You said very insightful, obviously very enlightening. I see the comments on the chat box. Um, really thanking all of you for making the time, for being engaged. Um, the next steps then is to really strengthen your submissions. You will receive emails from the technical team, just, uh, you know, sharing the checklists, the, you know, the executive summary, which you already have, that you use to submit, just strengthen it using the checklist and, you know, and the submission dates and the next steps processes will be shared. So I just really want to thank you on behalf um, of, of, of this team that's on the call today uh, and really wishing you the very best. I mean, we are very, very excited and very optimistic that this will really be, as, um, as Dr. Roland and others have said, you know, this is a very pioneering initiative and I know that the outcomes will, will be great and, and meet the overall bigger objectives of, of you know, empowering our African enterprises you know, to thrive, to become prosperous, and also to contribute to Africa's um, economy. So thank you so very much. I think we will continue to connect um, all, all with the next steps on email and do have a very blessed day. All the best. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Marima. As I see you say thank you for the clarifications and all that stuff. Yes. I'm glad you say that your expectations have been met and, uh, and thanking us for taking the time to organize this. You're most welcome. And thanks for your engagement too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be seeing you around. Um, feel free to, to leave and get in touch with us um, whenever it is that you need via email or any other way. All the best. Thank you all. Look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah. Yeah, me too.